Mine is different. <laughs> Those are revealed. <laughs> oh, it, it, it required. So the, this repository is with sub module set up and everything. Is just overkill. Well, I can do it, but I, um, no, well, I, I have a different image. It still works. No. That, that's my checksum of the FCL image. Okay, so there are many good versions. need to reconvene. Um, so Dorita, you're first, and then Michael, is that right? Yeah. You don't know? Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. So, uh, and Dorita, you'll be finishing the uh, section two with the uh, properties of business, right? I mean, oh. this is part of section three, I guess. Section three, okay. So it's uh, already section three. But it's here in section two. Okay. So let's uh, let's start again. Thank you for coming back. Yours, I see that the courageous ones are still here. Good. <laughs> okay. okay. So how much time are we? I think I think we should start slowly but uh, I mean I guess we can wait a, a few minutes more just in case do we see yeah we see a couple of a few empty computers so yeah we, we can yeah okay let's let's wait for the people to come back then I guess meanwhile uh,
How's the jet lag? <laughs> Everyone. I see. Dave's de jet lag is really bad. <laughs> you good? Yeah, we need we need coffee. We need coffee. There's there's a break. Uh, I think there's a coffee break at two. So uh, you know. So so if we if we get getting to like uh, miss the uh, the coffee break, someone please just you know raise your hand. Say hey, coffee break is at two. We should stop <laughs> for the coffee break. <laughs> Okay, I think I think I'm not sure we can't uh, we can uh, uh, wait uh, much more for the uh, couple of people that are uh, a bit late. Uh, so hopefully we we'll get them to sort of like a catch up. Uh, so Dorota, I think we, we should we just yeah. So we start. we will start from the same page as Yarek was pointing you to. So does anyone know how to get here? Who doesn't have this page? Okay, so the third part, it's your pro env. If you click on this, and you can go to presentation. I mean, for presentation, you don't have to follow exactly. For exercises, you might want to have this open for like copy and pasting. Okay, so in before lunch, uh, Jarek was talking about Git, GitHub and Datalab. So for me, these tools are like tools that uh, you can use for controlling your code, like Git, and controlling your data, like Datalab. So now I'll be talking about like container-based environments. And this, you can think about like tools that can con allows you to control your environments. So, so what are the container technologies? So basically the main idea is that uh, they isolate a computing environment and they allow to encapsulate the environment in self-contained units. So why do we need these containers? So because we're at the possibility workshop, you might, the first and most important things for us is the science of possibility. So basically like, because like every single project depends on not only on the code and data, but also on the computational environment. It's containers allow to encapsulate this environment so every single person can, can, share, can later try to recreate your work. But for something, if you don't think that is like good enough motivation, I will give you some like few smaller motivation that you might wanna use right away. So first of all, like collaborating with your colleagues. So you might often ask other people for help and it's much easier to get help if other people are, allow, are able to recreate your problem. So containers, as we're saying, can en encapsulate your environment, so you can easily share this with other colleagues. The second um, motivation is that you often, especially in new imaging, you might, wanna, you might start your workflow on your like, personal laptop and just run for like one subject, but, so, oh, but sooner or later you might have to change the hardware. So, and if you don't use containers, you would have to repeat entire installation process once again on different hardware. And you might have to do it like a few times during your PhD or postdoc time. The third one is like, especially like was important to me. So I think many scientists are uncomfortable like installing software so maybe I can ask like how many people are uncomfortable installing software? Everyone is comfortable? Huh? Okay, so uh, I personally don't think it's so much, I mean, it's kind of fun, but I was always scared. So basically I think for me like, it might, might be hard to believe that like installing one more software would solve the problem, but for me it's like having like, for example, like uh, container technologies, Docker technologies, that allows you to experiment in kind of like safe environment. So whenever you need, you can switch to your default environment and you can remove it. So I think it's like very useful for this, for like learning purposes as well. And the last one is like, if you are lucky, you might not have to even like install things because they might already exist. 
So for example, like for this tutorial, we didn't ask you to install all of the like software that we are using. We only use like we prepared a virtual like machine and you are using everything inside. And because we'll be using like mostly doing this presentation Docker, um, Docker Hub is also like excellent place to find uh, existing uh, images. So, uh, so for those who are like, so you already have some experience with working with virtual like um, with containers because you are using virtual machine right now. So basically like, so you know that like it's, it's basically like use the same hardware obviously because it's only like on your laptop, but it has like independent user space and software. Uh, and so basically like you don't have like so easy access to what is on your computer, um, but you can always make some additional like binding, mounting points to share for example like uh, directories or ports and we'll be practicing this later. So tools. Um, so there are two main uh, types of virtual of containers. First is called virtual machine, and this is what we are using today. So that's the main virtual machine you are using right now. But there are also like uh, containers um, type uh, containers, yeah. <laughs> And the most uh, common is uh, Docker, but during this uh, tutorial we will be also using Singularity. So um, the main idea is the same, is to isolate the computing environments so that you can later generate uh, the environments and you can easily share the environment. So the main difference between virtual machine and containers, uh, so on the left side you have like scheme of like virtual machine on the right Docker type, Docker container. So basically a virtual machine has to emulate entire computer software and hardware, and it's using hypervisor to share and manage hardware. Um, and guest machines are completely isolated and have dedicated resources. So for containers uh, like Docker, uh, they share the host systems kernel. Uh, they still have, um, isolated user space and they have independent uh, bins and libraries, but they are much lightweight and they are much faster to start. So, so like if you wanna like choose the technology that is good for you, uh, it might depend on many different things. So first of all, like it's the, uh, it's the hardware is uh, available to you. So you might have access to hardware that is already like um, designed to use specific uh, virtual machines or containers. Um, the other aspect is important to think where is your data. And for now, um, probably Docker might be the most portable technology right now. Um, the reason why we are not using Docker for this tutorial as a main container is like you like there are some installation issue for like Windows, mostly for Windows. And that's why we decided to use virtual machine. But we have exercises using Docker inside the virtual machine. And we will be also using Singularity because um, many, um, many HPC centers do not allow to install Docker inside. So, um, so yes, as I said, like um, Docker is the main, the most uh, well-known uh, container technology probably right now. Uh, but the problem is that can escalate privileges, and that's why HPC centers do not support this. So what is also good about Docker, like if you have Windows Pro and Mac OS X, you don't have to install a virtual machine anymore. If you have Windows Home, you still have to install it. Uh, no, you don't have to install it, it works, yeah. So, and also like Singularity, it, uh, for like both for Windows and Mac, you have to install a virtual machine. It only works um, on Linux. Um, so it's, the, it's designed for a scientific application and it's supported by, in many HPC centers. Um, so the good thing about like um, Singularity is also that you can use Docker images um, with Singularity. Okay, that, so that was the, my introduction. And 
now we will have like hands-on session. So if you go if you go back to the main page, you might want to open exercises because it might be easier to copy paste some of the like longer commands. So does anyone have question regarding introduction? So, uh, thank you. Quick question. So, to understand a little better, Docker, you can create a Docker in Linux and take that and bring it in Windows, and it will work. Or I think the mic doesn't work, but. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. All right. We just need to wake up. Uh, can if we create a Docker in Linux, can I take that and use it on Windows? Yes, but like so. So if you are creating like new, um, new operating system using Docker, I mean it's only you, you can only create Linux-based systems. So you can have like Docker images based on Ubuntu or Debian. You cannot have like you cannot have Docker image for Windows or for OS X, but you can use it everywhere. I don't know if that's. So one thing is like what type of system. So, but, but basically, if that person has a, a virtual box on the on, on the machine, then you could use that that. Uh, uh, so you would have a, a Linux-based uh, system on your Windows machine. I mean, you would use the, uh, but that was about Docker. Yes. But so, then, yeah. sorry, maybe I'm confused. No, I think you're right that the Docker image can be brought over to Windows as long as you have Docker installed on Windows and reused. But inside the Docker container, you can only have Linux-type environment. So for example, for a virtual machine, I, you can have like Windows virtual machine. It's not uh, possible with Docker, but I'm not sure, okay. So, um, so now, so I have like two exercises. One will be like creating Docker image with FSL and Python. And the second will be like more, I will concentrate main, um, more on um, using this Docker container. So, um, Okay, so so in order to have like a Docker container, you have to first create image, what is called like Docker image, and the way to build a uh, Docker image, you have to create a text file that has um, that is called Docker file. So basically, Docker file contains all instruction. What do you wanna? I install within Docker, uh, within Docker container, and what do you want to run within Docker container right away? So, the simplest Docker file might look like this. So basically, you always start from some base image. As I said, it's always some kind of Linux. So it might be Debian, it might be Ubuntu, like in this case. And you run, um, and later you ask for software to install. So in this case, uh, I was using apt-get to install git and emacs. But if you, but if you have like um, more requirements, if you wanna install, for example, FSL, the Docker file might, might look like this. It also might be much longer. So basically like Docker file um, might get complicated, especially if you are using like various uh, software. So that's why today I would, um, encourage you to use NeuroDocker. So basically, NeuroDocker uh, allows you to generate Docker file or Singularity file for new imaging software. So if you go to NeuroDocker website, sorry? Uh, you can click on NeuroDocker. So here's the list of software that is currently supported. So you can see you have like new imaging software like Afni, ANS, 
You also have like more general software like Python and um, yeah. So um, today we'll be using new Docker. So as I said, it can simplify the creating of Dockerfy and it also incorporates the best practice uh, for installation. So my, your, so your image is not bigger than it has to be. And uh, yes, it also can use RepoZip that Satra, I believe, will be talking about. Will you? Okay, for, um, for minifying existing Docker images. So basically like the same, um, the same Docker file using new Docker um, so can be, can be created using new Docker uh, by, by typing this command. So that's what we'll be doing like as our first exercise. So I wanna to build like new Docker image that has FSL inside. So here is maybe one thing that I want to mention, like with Neural Docker, you can um, install FSL directly from FSL website. This command is a bit like longer because we are using, um, we, we're installing FSL from Neural Debian. So it's, uh, it actually like, it might be much smaller. This is, but this is only for 509, if that's important to you. Um, Okay, so I will go now to our virtual machine. Uh, okay. Mm, what was it? Okay. So everyone should be in the section two. So if you don't know how to get there, is source activate. Um, section two. If you are in section two, you should be, you should already have this in your prompt. Okay, so if you are in section two, if you are in the uh, home directory, just in case you can type cd tilde. And we'll create a new directory, so you can type mkdir. And we will change our directory to go there. You can use tab as Yarek was pointing you. And we will, um, and this is the place you might wanna copy paste the command. So once you are within this directory, you can copy paste the docker run command to create docker file. Oh, okay. So who has problem with copy pasting? Anyone? So remember, especially the Mac, Mac users, remember that the keyboard shortcut you often use on the Mac has uh, the command whereas uh, on the paste in your virtual machine uses the controls. So uh, watch carefully which uh, the right pasting and copying are for the different machines that from your one yeah. to the other. So you, you can copy whatever you are copying usually, and once you are in terminal in virtual machine, you just can click on the right side of your touch uh, pad and just use paste. Okay, so this is like pretty quick, so right now we only create a Docker file, so you can check this that it exists in your directory. You can also cut this Docker file, and you can see that it's much longer than the command itself. So, so this is only Docker files. We this is like text file. We didn't create any image yet. So, in order to create Docker image, we have to type Docker. Docker build and it's dash t uh, and this is where the name of your image you are creating goes. So I was using my FSL and this is the, the name that I will be using in example. So you can choose whichever name you want but you would have to change this later. And what is important is dot at the end. So one thing that I forgot to mention that uh, when Docker 
is building image. It has layers. So you'll see in this example, we have like eight layers. And every single layer is for like installing like different things or creating, running different commands. So one thing that is like, does anyone, is anyone still waiting for this? No. So you can actually go to my presentation to have history here. So one reason why it was like, so this, um, we were installing FSL, so you might wonder why it was so fast. So because I, wanted, I didn't want to wait too long, I was cheating a bit. So this image actually very like exactly the same image already existed in your in your virtual machine. So this is actually also like nice thing about Docker. So it it has layers, and it only changes layers that you don't have on your computer because we had all layers already installed. That was fast. It can just reuse the same layers for different image. So if you if you wanna check if you have this image, you can type Docker images. And okay, I was checking many things before, so you shouldn't have as many images as I have. Um, yeah, but you, if you, you you can see, I have like my FSL here. Okay, so oh sorry, so that was the image that you. Okay, so this is the way how we create image using um, Docker image using Neural Docker. And um, there's like similar command for Singularity if you didn't wanna use uh, Docker but Singularity. The Neural Docker image, Neural Docker command is very similar. For, uh, for building the image itself, you to use sudo Singularity build. But I don't wanna you to use it, uh, do it now. You already have this image on your computer. So what I want you to do is like uh, creating new image. So as I pointed to you, you have like you can go to New Docker uh, website, and here you will go directly to examples. So you, here you have like all list of examples of um, how to create Docker files for different for different software. So I want you to add here is the example. I want you to add to our existing command. Um, to our existing uh, image Python. So you already have, you are already have this, no, this is Singularity, sorry. You already were using this command to create Docker file. And I want you to try to add Python to this installation based on the, on the help from our website, from your Docker website. So for those who are not familiar with Python, you were using like Miniconta, so you, you, should, you should search for Miniconta. And I can give you like four minutes. How much time do I have? Use the mic, uh, possible. Yes, so uh, I think for people who install, uh, who downloaded the files um, recently, because the, I was using the latest version of NeuroDocker, the latest version of NeuroDocker has changed, and that's how it's, yeah, I do think so. Do you think we should have used the container to? No, you should just wait. So one of the things that is important is the version of these tools that you're using. So the reason it's rerunning is because the version of the underlying container has updated and it was referred to by the latest version. And that's, I think, something that's quite important in the context of reproducibility, that you want to use a very specific version so that you can re-execute it in the same way. 
So for here, I actually was not using, so that's... Although, I don't know, because... Okay, I don't know. Where did we define that version? Once again, oh, okay. So, so in this case, I will define here. So if you go, um, maybe I will go like, I mentioned Docker Hub. So let's, for example, go to Ubuntu. So you see that this is like official repository for Ubuntu, and for many uh, package, um, for many like for many images, you will have also tags here, and you have different tags. So if you wanna later use this specific version of Ubuntu image, you have to add. Sorry. Oh. So here, for example, like Docker pull Ubuntu. Sorry. Instead of uh, just using Docker pull Ubuntu, that's the way how, how you download the images. You would have like 16.04. Is it that the way? Is that the version? One of. Yeah. For example, this one. So you have the name of the image, and you have comma, and you can add tag. If you are not using any tag, if you don't uh, specify tag, it would take the latest. And that's the problem with latest, like Satra was mentioning. So that tag is still not going to give you a precise version, because as they update 16.04, they just keep updating that. So you can see really? that all of those images were updated 11 days okay. ago. Okay. Okay. Right? So as they apply security updates. However, Xenial 2018.05.25 is a much more fixed version of Ubuntu. Now, okay. all of these are kind of things that you have to think about. Uh, for some cases, the latest might be fine. But if you were to do reproducible thing and you were to put this container out there saying, I want to use this container two years from now, don't want to be pulling the latest version of Ubuntu when I build that container, then you should tag it with a very specific version that's available. Um, so a, um, a single point of failure is Docker Hub. Um, and so how do we, um, so do we have to trust that they will always have the images available? And no. <laughs> This is pretty much the problem which we kept preaching about because even here, you know, those tags change. So you don't have guarantee that what you're using is actually what you were using before, which is a latest, right? And then Docker Hub is gone, everything is gone, right? And Docker Hub is the point of exchange. But we could keep those images within version control system. Annex allows us to put arbitrarily big files into version control system, right? And associate information where they're available from. So at the beginning, we could associate, oh, they come from, let's say, Singularity Hub or Docker Hub. And if they're gone from Singularity Hub or Docker Hub, or Docker Hub doesn't exist, at least somebody like you might have that image and you maintain information that you have those images available somewhere. And then you could fetch it, you could share it again on some, I don't know, Dropbox, right? while your Git Annex repository will maintain information where they are available from. So that's our solution to the problem that those images indeed could be gone, they could be changed, even though tag will stay the same, it might be different image. But version control systems are cool, or content trackers are cool, right? <laughs> and they allow you to maintain information about their origins. So like, I guess I guess you could always have the tag having the uh, the exact hash or something that uh, and then verify that the tag is actually the right. Uh, thing. <laughs> okay, so um, so I'm still waiting for the build. Okay, so um, so who installed Python within? 
the image. Do we have any success? So are we, I think I don't really have time to do it now, but. So basically, if you want to install Python, you would use Miniconda. And so it would be like very similar lines like this. But if you want to have like only Python without like extra, like extra packages, you will just remove NumPy, Pandas, it right. Um, but now if, uh, I don't want to do it now because I think we don't have time. But you can try, track just images you already have. So hopefully everyone has my FSL. If you don't have if you don't have my FSL, at least you should have FSL. So you can always like for the rest of my tutorial you can use FSL if you were not able to use uh, to build my FSL. Okay. Mm. So so once we have this image, we we can run we can run a con Docker container. So the simplest uh, command to run it, container is just Docker run. So you can type Docker run my FSL. And you see that actually nothing happened because, oh gosh, okay. Because um, basically that's, this command only runs. We don't have any commands within the image. So basically it created the container and it just left. And we didn't ask for anything, so that's kind of like that's why we didn't have any output and nothing interesting happened. So to do something more interesting, we can because we install FSL, we can try to run now FS, uh, bet. So maybe first you can see that if you just type bet, we don't have bet in our virtual machine. So, but it should be in your it should be in your um, Docker image. So we can type docker um, my FSL bet. And you see now that actually what happened is that now um, you ask for a specific command. So the bet was run within the container and the standard output was printed in our virtual machine. So now you can use actually like try to run this bet on like um, using one of the T1 images that we had. So I believe already. Oh, okay. So you, I forgot to update this. So we will use because already Yarek asked you to install this data set. So I don't want to do it once again. So the only thing you can so don't create a data file because you already have this data set. So you should have. So you should have, if you type, sorry, you, you should go to the, your home directory and you can check the content. So you should have, where is it? DS, this directory. But I believe you didn't in, download any single image. Uh, yeah, any single image, yeah. Any single uh, file. So now you can, Use data lad get to actually download the content of the of the file. So we'll be using only one file. So that's also like very nice about data lad that you install entire um, entire like repository, but you can only download one file. So we'll be downloading this T1. Mm. And you see, this is like the time, the, the moment that data lot is actually downloading anything. So, as I said at the very beginning, there is like, this is like uh, your container and your host machine. So, kind of now, the virtual machine is kind of host machine for Docker. So um, you are not sharing any any directories, any any resources. So now, if you wanna use the the file that exists on your virtual machine on your host system, you can mount this directory. So you can type Docker run. 
And here is the, the new things that we use. So we're using dash V, and we remount the, yes. You can also copy paste from the slides. So you remind, you remind the directory from the virtual machine, so from the host system, to the Docker. And within Docker, we'll be using data as the name of the directory. And you can use bat. And maybe we can actually copy paste the rest of the command because I don't remember. Okay. So here, like, once again, oh no. So here is once again, so we are running um, again bed within our container, but this time we're using dash V option to mount the directory. So we'll be mounting our directory that is called DS000114 to the directory within the container that is called data. So that's why, oh, now I'm missing the, the name of the image, my FSL, <coughs> FSL. And now we are running bat command. So the bat command takes the name of the input and the name of the output. So here we'll be using this is the path to our input. So as you can see, we have to use the, the path from the container. That's why you don't have DS000114, but you have the data. And you can run it. So now it's, it's, it takes time because actually like you're using, but okay. So you can try, you can, You can see if anything happened, and you, if you if you check the content of your directory, you will see that nothing was created, because actually we what happened was like we only mounted oh okay we only mounted one di uh, one where is it one directory, so we only mounted the input, but still like the output stays in within the container. So we didn't point it to the output directory. So it was like, it was run, and the output exists, but it's within a container. So to get actually output within the host system, we can create in the host system uh, output directory. And to our like previous comment, you can add, because you can, you can actually mount as many directories as you want. So you can use, a, another dash V output um, and if you are lost you can you can always go to page number 19 create the output and copy paste this command and you can add it make mistake because like dash V has to be before the name of the image. What? Sorry. Oh, oh yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So you also have to specify the, the output full path. Oh, typo, okay. I'm getting there, yeah. <laughs> I cannot use type completion here. Okay, so now, 
Any, yeah, so does anyone need help? Or you have question about the commands? So now if you, if you check the content of your directory, you see that it's output because we created this directory and we can go inside and check it. And you see that the output is in your host, system, host home directory. Uh, sorry, what does it mean when you have two dash Vs? So, so dash V is, uh, it allows you to mount directory. So in this example, I'm I was just mounting two directories. So, uh, yeah, the so first dash V is for like the data directory and the second dash V is for my output. Should I finish? Okay. So, um, so you have like more like eight pages for my exercises. So you, you can see how to run, inter uh, how to open the, an interactive session within Docker and how to remove containers from your, from your computer. So you can check this later. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, now we have pretty much completed all the uh, overviews of the individual tools and, and building blocks that are necessary for um, put, you know, actually conducting in a reproducible um, or re-executable analysis as a, as a first step. And uh, what we're going to do now, um, or what we're going to start now, is um, actually conduct uh, one of those analyses where we where we pluck these pieces all together and, and produce something that will then be a candidate for, for archiving and you know, re-execution exploration uh, in the future. So I will just take a few minutes to, to uh, outline that. So we will start from uh, DICOM data uh, that, is, that is available uh, on the web for, for this demo and, and by that we'll simulate the situation that we just finished scanning pretty much and we got the data in a form uh, that you would get it from an uh, MRI scanner and then we built uh, on, on top of that starting point all the building blocks necessary. So we'll, we'll do um, conversion into nifty format uh, in, a, in a bit structured data set as you've seen in, in part one and we'll uh, use a container with that DICOM converter to do that and then uh, we'll, we'll take a quick break and, and get yet another update on how to conduct uh, analysis and then we'll come back to this exercise and actually do the analysis with the container in a, in a fully reproducible and re-executable uh, way. So uh, the concept um, or the, the, the implementation concept that we are using is also available in the, in the data lab software. So what you can see here is basically a, a depiction of, uh, of a data lab data set. And you can, you can see that at the, at the uh, lowest level, uh, there are um, other data sets being referenced. referenced. So DataLet has a, a way that you can track other data sets, which may contain uh, input data, uh, in a what we call a super data set. So what that does is basically tracks the version or the, the state of an entire um, database if you want, right? So all your DICOM files that you acquired in a study could be in a data set and, and uh, analysis data set could reference that. And then a data data set can also track uh, container images like the ones you, you, you just uh, created. And it can also track any kind of custom processing code that uh, you usually develop or at least modify for a particular analysis. So all these things end up in, in a data set and then the last bit data it will do for you is it will actually execute that custom code in the containers that you need to turn the inputs that you referenced into the outputs and it will also track those outputs. So everything that is your analysis is then represented uh, in, in one data set. And it combines all the features that Yarek mentioned before so you don't have to actually carry the data around so the stuff that you archive is really minimal. And with that kind of technology we can, we can conduct 
uh, an analysis in a, in a straightforward, pretty much if you've done it a few times, um, way that keeps all the individual components of an analysis uh, separate but connected in the modular way. So you'll have a representation of the raw data as it came from the scanner, no bit changed, right? Then you turn that into an analyzable uh, uh, format like the bit structured data set. Then you can run uh, one or more types of standard preprocessing or tailored preprocessing for your analysis. And then you conduct several analyses from that one and they will lead to multiple publications, hopefully, and all of those could be in data sets. So any part that you take here will be able to trace back to the very origin of any single uh, data file that, that was involved in the production of a particular result uh, or paper. And we'll do two steps here. Uh, first, we'll, we'll do this uh, conversion or this step from going from the raw data into the bits uh, uh, structured data as, as a first. Uh, these, these are the, the commands um, that were up uh, during the break, and I hope they, they all worked out for you. Um, and if you now click on, on or not you don't click on this link, but this is the same page uh, that you were on um, before. So I will um, now open this in the uh, um, the virtual box itself. If it, if it lets me do that, okay. Give it a second, and I put the uh, the page side by side. So the page you need to go to looks looks like this. So everybody up. Cool. So uh, what I just said is written down in the introduction. So if you scroll through that page, it has tons of text. Uh, it's not meant that you that, that or, or it's not intended that you read through all of that. So I will guide you through this, but it should be comprehensive enough that you can go back next week after the conference and and reproduce all these uh, these little things. And there's also the outcome of this analysis also uh, on the web on GitHub for you. The link is is at the very bottom if you if you make it through. So uh, you can skip the entire introduction because it contains, with a few more words, simply just what I said uh, right now. It's important uh, for those who haven't done that yet to uh, activate the software environment, but if you've executed any data light command so far, you've already done that and you're safe. Um, you, can, you can create a, a separate directory for this lesson if you, if you like. So again, the introduction just has uh, the narrative that I just gave to you. I'll give you a few more um, information on the way. And so here, here we have the, the, the section that this first exercise will be about, which is, as I said, the conversion of the raw data from um, the, the DICOM format into, uh, into the bits format. And the DICOMs that we provide, you will see the URL in a second, they, are, uh, they encode study metadata already uh, using uh, the reprenym naming conventions, which allow you to put things like uh, the, the, the label of the task that the subject performed during an acquisition into the protocol names uh, of the uh, image series. So you can sit at the scanner console when you plan the acquisition and put all that information in. What we'll do now is we'll use a tool called UDConf that can use that information and generate you a bits compatible or bits compliant data set automatically so you don't have to uh, actually edit uh, files as much. Uh, and anything that we do starts with the creation of a data led data set. So unlike you know, the consumption of a data led data set that you already did by downloading uh, the, the 114, we'll now create one. So the first uh, section is about uh, creating a data set uh, called localizer scans because this is the uh, type of data that we're using. It's a an, um, fusiform phase area localizer uh, experiment. So use the create command to create such a data set. And put your pink sticker up if there are any unexpected problems with that. And if you can do that, you're, you're perfectly set up for the rest. It was audible. 
So again, this is the this is the page uh, reproducible imaging org the, that you've seen before. OHBM training. I think I've seen this on everybody's laptops. A anybody did not find that page? Okay, all good. So we don't fix a problem that doesn't exist. Okay. So the, it's kind of straightforward how to do this, and we'll do it. Uh, we'll do it right here. I'll create. Uh, is that big enough for you? Like this? Yes. Sure. Um, so we'll create um, a folder, um, lesson three, and enter that folder. So everything is. Yeah, so uh, and now we can see I, I activated the, the environment. It tells me in the prompt, so I have data led. I can do data led, and it tells me yes, I I work. Uh, and then we do data led create localizer scans, and it creates a data led data set. Does something and tells me it's okay. Whenever it tells you okay, it thinks it's okay. So we can we go into this uh, into this uh, folder, make it a little bigger, and you can you can see that there is pretty much no content in there other than a few hidden files. So what you created is simply uh, a, a Git repository with a few uh, additions that are data light specific that we but that we don't have to worry about for now. And now um, we will um, create this link between. The, uh, uh, the raw data that's provided on the web and this data set, which will contain the converted uh, data structure that is BITS compliant. And we, we use the install command that you've already seen. With one little twist, there is one option that you can give to register another repository which uh, lives on the, uh, um, on, on the web. Here, the, the link to it is behind this word GitHub here. So if you, if you right click and say uh, copy link location, that's the link of the data set that we want to install. So now I'll already type it in so we can use the, the install command and then we specify the current folder as the data set that we want to install into. And you, you can see in the in the prompt, I'm in the uh, of uh, in the data set localizer scans. So the dot is a is a shell symbol to reference the directory that I'm currently in. And then I'm telling it via the source uh, argument, what uh, do I want to install? So I can just give the URL. This is the the link you can you can copy, and then I I tell it. Um, where in that data set should this new data set be referenced? Or it's actually not a new one, but the copy of this data set. And we go for inputs raw data. There's not really a convention, but um, it's nice to have all the inputs and inputs or some other folder that you want to, uh, want to, want to have. So we can execute that. And it will uh, obtain about 20 megabytes from, from GitHub. So it might uh, take a second. I'm doing it live. takes more than a few seconds. I'll show you the results and we'll, we'll have it run in the background. I guess I'll, I'll sh show you the result right away. Who is familiar with Git support for every user? Oh, it's done. Awesome. So we, we, we see that it, it, it says it installed OK, and it, it reports us some actions that it performed. It edited something and saved something. But, but what we're really interested in, uh, we're interested in the subdataset list. And sub data sets. 
and it will tell us that it created a sub or it, it established a sub data set in the, in this folder. So we now uh, could could take a look there, say input uh, raw data, and it has a folder structure that it obtained um, with tons of DICOMs. So we now have established that that reference between input data within the data set that will contain our output data. And now we've learned that you know software environments are volatile things and we really want to keep track and uh, DICOM converters are particularly interesting to keep track of because they're pretty much the first thing you do to the data. So if they have any problem, everything will have a problem. Right? So you want to insulate yourself against sudden changes in the, in the environment uh, and we can do that by using a container. And the, the way to do this is uh, Datalite has an extension which is installed for you. It's called Datalite data, data Container that gives you uh, three management uh, commands, one to add containers and one to run software within containers, pretty much like the uh, Docker run that you just saw, but with knowledge of what a data set uh, in, in, uh, or data -like data set is and where it stores its, uh, its images. So what we can do now is we can, um, we can data let containers at a container, container, and because we, we don't wanna um, in, spend all the time downloading things, we're doing something that is actually more complicated than what you would do uh, at home. So data let containers add takes a uh, name of a container. Here we're using the name of the software that's the prominent guest in that container. It's called Hudiconf, heuristic DICOM conversion. Uh, it's one of the possible um, DICOM converters. This one is interesting because it automatically can generate a bits compliant uh, data structure. And then we could just simply give it the URL to uh, something that's called Singularity Hub, which is the same thing as the Docker Hub, this exchange platform for images just for singularity. But we are going to actually use um, a, a local, um, local, local copy of it, which lives in your images UDConf uh, as image file. And then the call becomes a little more complicated because it doesn't know that this is a singularity image and we have to tell it how to execute that thing. So you've seen Docker run before. With Singularity, you can say Singularity Axec, and then the name of the image as you've done it just now, and then the command, which is what we're, we're providing here. And then we can say data let containers list, and you need to type it correctly. And it tells you, okay, I have a container in this folder, and it's an image file. That's how DataLite represents that container inside. But the thing is, now that it's an image file and it, it knows uh, where to get it. So in our case, it knows that it comes from this folder in the VM, but if you would have used this command, it will actually have, uh, would have resolved the URL to that singularity hub image file where it actually lives somewhere in the cloud and reference that within the uh, in the in the uh, data set. So you can you can reobtain that later on, even if the singularity hub front end is no longer there. And now you also have a copy, and the the, the system knows that you have a copy, and you could share that copy, and it will keep track of that copy that you have outside of the reach of of, of singularity. So now we have um, we have all the bits, the bits pretty much. Uh, uh, in place, we have referenced the input DICOM data. We have a computational environment that contains the software that we want to run. The only thing that's left to do is we need to run it. And data that will take care of the entire rest. So it will run the software, it will see what data artifacts, files, directories it, it produces, and it will capture all the outputs and, and reference them. So unfortunately, UDConf is a very capable beast of a software and has many, many options. So I'm not even going to make the attempt to, to type this in, uh, but I will illustrate uh, what it does. So I'll, I'll put in the, the, the pieces that are important. So we call data let containers run, which is like Docker run, the thing that runs the container. And then uh, we can, we can uh, tell DataLed to 
record the change produced uh, by this command under a specific message. So there's dash m or a dash dash mes message. So what we do is we convert subject two's DICOMs into the bits uh, format. This will then be the human readable message in the, in the history of that data set. So we know this was our intent when we ran that command, right? And for some people, English is better readable than, than shell commands. Uh, for some, shell commands are. Definitely the shell commands are the more precise language. Uh, and then we, we, uh, we don't actually have to do it, but for the, for the sake of demonstration, we do it. We, we tell it what, um, what container to run this command in, which will follow now. If there's only one container, data will figure out, if you're running containers run, and there's a container, we'll run this in the container that we know, right? But you can also have multiple containers and, and switch between the two. And then this thing has nothing to do with data led. This is the uticonf command that actually converts uh, the, the DICOMs. And the essential bit is pretty much this one. We point it to the folder that has the DICOMs. And now we can run this thing, and it will produce awesome output loads that you can you can study next week what it's trying to, to tell us. So it's reading in 5,000 ICOM images um, while I'm trying to bridge the gap. And then it will analyze them. It will look through the metadata, which is in the uh, reponym conventions. And then it will sort out uh, what will be the bits compliant output file names for each DICOM image uh, series that's in the data, and it will create a folder structure that is in the right format, and it will add the JSON metadata files that you created by hand in the beginning uh, automatically, and then DataLed will capture that result. Yes? There's, uh, we need a microphone there. Yes. It's, it's, it's a little more than a wrapper, but uh, this call, uh, and I think uh, it, it, so this part here tells it for the, for the actual you know, core conversion, it uses uh, DCM to NIX. And, but all the, you know, the, uh, there, there's stuff around it, like the sorting of the DICOMs, et cetera, that, that's done. You could achieve a similar result with uh, DCM to NIX uh, yourself. You lose a little bit of the convenience. And it wouldn't, DCM to NIX wouldn't be able to interpret those reponym uh, conventions. And the, the link to those is, is in the documentation. Uh, question here. Yes. Uh, what is dash O slash TMP UDCon? Why is it there and why not yeah. inside the data set? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in a conversation with the, with the UDCon for authors to make this not necessary. Right now, it helps us go through this exercise. So almost done. So now the actual conversion part is finished and uh, the metadata files are being created. And then we'll see in a second what, what files it has produced. And we have three minutes till the coffee break and we'll make it. There we go. So uh, you can see that DataLed tells us what files it has added to the uh, repository. I'll make it I'll make it bigger for a second. And you can you can see that it it figured out you know file names that looked like they are bits compliant and they actually are. And now this whole thing is uh, encoded in the dataset's history. So there's a tool called uh, um, you could use Git log to figure this out. Um, and there's also a tool that's called TIG that I like to use. It's Git spelled backwards, which gives you a little bit better representation. So this is the change we recorded in the data set. See the data led recorded uh, what commands we ran. It also captured the files. And all these files are now in this Git annex thing that Yarek mentioned before. So their identity is tracked, not the content. The content is local as you, you would have done uh, that before. 
but you can now move the content also elsewhere, which is something that we, we're not going to talk about. So the only thing missing now uh, that we have to do in order to be able to actually analyze the data is something that we cannot get from the DICOMs, which is the information, what kind of stimulation that subject received at what point during the experiment. That usually comes from a text file that is generated by your uh, stimulation implementation. And uh, in bits, there's also a standard representation for this kind of information, which is called the events TSV files. You have seen TSV files uh, before. And um, the, the data set that we got from GitHub already has the right uh, file in the TSV format. It just doesn't have it uh, in, the, in the right location. So um, this uh, exercise tells you where it will live. And after you've digested the, the, the uh, section one of today's uh, exercise, that shouldn't come as a surprise to you. Uh, what might not be uh, yet very obvious is that we need to capture this, I got this file from somewhere step also in order to make this entire analysis completely reproducible from the raw data. Because anything, any file that you just copy in here and you get add to, re the, to the repository will have no information of, of where it was coming from. But in this case, that comes from a data set that we got from the web and we need to capture that information. And um, if, we, if we can even use a data light command to, to, to capture the output of a simple shell command like copy that you've, uh, you've used before. And so we can, we can simply do this. Uh, I'll copy it in here for, for speed reasons. So we can call data let run, which is just like containers run, it takes the exact same options except for it doesn't work with containers, it works directly in the environment because copy is a built-in command. And we tell it what we're doing, we're importing the stimulation events. And, and now I'm going to show you a feature that it has. So we can, we can tell run uh, what are the inputs into a command and what kind of outputs are we expecting. And if we do that, even that kind of information is captured in the uh, record, the data that will be produced. So you can ask that data set, what are the inputs? And essentially what you're building up is a, is a graph of information, what inputs across many, many stages of processing were responsible for producing an output. And now you're saying, oh, but now I have to type everything twice because it also needs into the copy command. But that's not true because the, uh, in data let run, you can use placeholders to reference every, everything that you specified before. So we can now just run this and it will do nothing but copy the file from the location in the, in the sub data set into the location that is relevant uh, for, for the bit standard, and we'll have that step covered. So if we look at the history again, we can see it, it captured the, the, the record and already uh, produced a reference of the result and it stored it under this uh, hash in the, in the annex. So what you now have, you could, you could take this uh, data set to the bits validator and it will complain about a few things that it couldn't guess, for example, you know, the, the version it's compliant with, the name of the data set, et cetera. So anything it doesn't, uh, it, it cannot extract from the, from, the, uh, from the metadata that it has access to, you would still need to fill in manually. But the, the, the most important bits, like here's the participant's uh, TSV file, these things are pre-populated automatically for you. So it's a really cool thing because you have to you think less and rely on the expertise of all the other people that contributed to this piece of software. And this is where we'll uh, pause for the moment and go to the coffee break, and then we'll take this data set and turn it into an analysis. Yes, there's, we need a microphone. Where do you find the information? Where do I find what information? Uh, information the In here? That is, that is because the, uh, um, the, uh, so the, the age and the uh, gender of the subject is coming from the DICOM uh, metadata. So yeah, you encode that uh, at the prior to the acquisition stage. You register the patient, and then you have to you know type in the, the weight for the SAR limits, etc., including the age and the, the gender. And how about the fact that it's a control subject? Uh, I think this is Uticom making a bold statement that uh, it's probably a control subject. <laughs> but you can so th these files are editable. You can just go and 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 correct that, and also add all the other variables that are interesting in your particular context, which may or may not come from the, uh, or may be in the DICOM metadata. 
some questionnaire items, that kind of stuff. Can all go in there. Coffee or questions? Coffee.
think of it here? Yeah, it's like one, except like it was only one in this part, but that we cannot find enter one. But then they have an enter one. Why are they? I mean, it's, it's working. It's, it's like I don't no, know it's why. No, no, but it, then they.
So if you ran any commands in the previous section and you got warnings of the style entry point something 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 broken error, then can you go back quickly to the? Okay. Oh no, to you. Uh, I'm closing tabs by yeah. clicking on them. Um. Then you, you rerun this line, and the important bit is the full in the brackets. It will pull down a few more packages, takes a few seconds, but then that whole warning thing goes away. There's the left button, right button. And this? All right, I think I'm going to get started. I think most people are back. Can people hear me well? All right. Uh, before I start, uh, so I'm going to click on neuroimaging workflows over there if you want to follow along some of the pieces. Uh, I'm doing this a little bit of a tag team with Michael. We, we're trying to figure out uh, how to get the most of these workflow processing things and data lad into your fingertips and finger memory. Uh, but before I start, I just want to say a sentence or two about repro in. So you downloaded a set of DICOMs and you were told that it was formatted or collected using the repro in standard. And what the repro in standard really is, is about taking DICOMs or when you're at the scanner console, naming them in a particular way such that Hudicon, the tool that you use to convert it, can do an automatic conversion of those DICOMs to bids. So manual conversion of DICOMs to bits takes a fair bit of effort. You need to organize things in a particular way. By naming things right at the source, you simplify the conversion process. Now, if you don't have the capability of naming things at the source, and that's true of some scanner centers, or, then you can learn about additional characteristics of Hudicon, which allow you to create what's called a heuristic file, hence the name heuristic DICOM converter, that's where HUDICON comes from, that you can take either existing DICOMs that are not in that format and convert it to bids automatically through this heuristic uh, or current DICOMs that are not labeled that way. So I just wanted to make that out there, and if you have any questions, talk to Yarek about repro and naming. Okay, so this part has a presentation which I'll be giving and I'm going to try and keep that short. I'm going to try and tie up some of the things that have been discussed over the morning and till now. And then the, there are two exercises. Michael is going to do the first exercise. The second exercise for sake of time is listed there and you should be able to deal with it later on. If we have time, we can come back to it. But I think just given our schedule, we're going to skip the second exercise for now. But it's all there, and you should be able to follow along with it later on. Okay. So, so I think you have been executing some computation, and most of you have done some bit of processing in your life. Uh, for your various research projects. We're going to talk a little bit about what executing computation really means, but more importantly, from a reproducibility perspective, what does tracking computation mean? And then there'll be the exercises to work with this. 
Uh, we tend to abstract things out. Uh, we write scripts, we click on GUIs, uh, but there are many sorts of things that allow various kinds of abstraction. And really, the reason we go and do this abstraction is so that we can do certain things like reuse components, that we don't have to write scripts for every single data set we collect. Uh, and there are many ways to process data. Many of us are familiar with various kinds of GUIs. Uh, we use different kinds of shell scripts, uh, Python scripts, R, MATLAB scripts. All of these create procedural abstractions. And so if you're sitting on that command line or inside a MATLAB or an R shell or terminal and typing things every single time, you abstract away uh, what you want to do with the data away from the data itself. But there are also data flow frameworks, and one of the frameworks we work with is NiPipe, which is a Python-based framework for neuroimaging. But there are MATLAB-based frameworks like Automated Analysis and PSOM as well. So depending on your flavor of uh, tools that you want to work with, there are many things out there that may help you abstract away this, the computation you want to do from the with the data from the data itself. And then if you structure data in, say, bids, you also get an abstraction that allows different kinds of applications to run automatically on a bids data set. So whether your data set A is a bids data set or your data set B is a bids data set, you don't think about it very much. You can run the same kinds of tools. And then you learned a little bit about containers, and that was really a very surface-oriented intro to containers. They have a lot of powerful capabilities. I would highly recommend you to look at Docker and Singularity, depending on the kind of environment and setup you have. Now, most of your local laptops would be able to run Docker without any problem. Uh, you, for Windows folks, you may have to do a little bit of tweaking to get things to run. But in general, uh, you should be able to install some version of Docker on your local things. For Singularity, you would have to get to an HPC system unless you're using a Linux laptop, in which case you can run Singularity on a Linux laptop quite easily. So we think we do this because of certain principles. First, as we were talking about separating computation from data flow or data management. And that's really the first abstraction that we do when we write scripts or create workflows, is separate these two things out. We also like to be modular. Instead of a one giant script that does everything, we try to say, can we create reusable pieces? And if we create reusable pieces, we can share those reusable pieces. Uh, as you already have used certain things, there's an FSL container there, uh, there's a Hudiconf container there. Yes, you, they're simple enough containers that you could recreate any single time, but you can also hand them off to somebody else and they would have your exact environment. And the same thing can be said of code or scripts that you write. And if you put them out on GitHub or some other venue, then other people can reuse things. We do a lot of things that are similar across different projects. And the more we can reuse over recreating, it actually helps catch a lot of bugs that happen in workflows. Uh, standardizing inputs and outputs. Uh, you've got a bit of a flavor of an IDM, and you've mostly heard about bids. But these kinds of abstractions allows us to create things where our tools and our scripts can make assumptions. This is how I expect to find data. And those assumptions, if you can standardize those assumptions, that makes it easier to write scripts and tools. So using standards are very useful in making sure that you can reuse things that you create. Uh, being interoperable. If you think of all the packages that are out there, uh, there are certain packages that can't do certain things, and there are certain packages that have certain advantages over other packages. So you may want to switch around or move around from package to package for different aspects of processing. And if you can write scripts, if you can encapsulate them, if you can use environments such as containers to s install those packages and reuse them, now you can start using these different packages quite easily. Uh, Dorota mentioned NeuroDocker, it can install SPM. So for those of you who want to use something from SPM alongside something from FSL, you can do that within that container framework. So it's quite nice to have that kind of flexibility around such that you can optimize the kind of processing you do instead of thinking about, oh no, I, how do I switch to X? And probably the most important thing is this idea of encapsulation and isolation. We start working on our laptops, and not just our desktop gets cluttered, everything gets cluttered, because we start installing everything into our home directories, into our systems. 
And we really don't know what interactions are happening across software effectively within those cases. So by encapsulating things in these isolated environments, we allow for very precise control over the environments, even if our desktops are cluttered with all these isolated environments. And that's something I think worth thinking about. Uh, I used to say when I first started grad school, my uh, workflow looked like the one on the left. Uh, more recently, this is almost about 20 years later, it looks like the one on the right. And things have gotten complex for various reasons. Uh, complexity might come with workflows being more robust, uh, things that are able to handle different kinds of things. Uh, complexity might come from new tools that can deal with certain pieces of data better than others. But nonetheless, complexity can increase in various ways. And keeping track of this through just writing scripts or rewriting scripts can often be difficult. And I think using data flow frameworks allows you to abstract away such computation from your data sets quite nicely. Well, scripts do not work by themselves. So you need to install software. And this is just an example of software supported within the NiPy platform. We use a lot of different things for different kinds of things. Let's say you were doing diffusion SPM for functional MRI analysis. You know, SPM doesn't have anything for diffusion analysis. You might use FSL for diffusion analysis, but then you may want to integrate the results of things. So these kinds of data flow frameworks allow you to integrate and interoperate across these tools. Now, it does place a cognitive load. You need to understand how these op packages operate. And that's like learning anything in science. Uh, if you're doing neuroscience, you're learning about different parts of the brain, different cognitive processes. If you're doing software or using software, you should go and learn about the different pieces of software that are out there. Uh, there was a mention of virtual machines. You've been using it all day, and that's an encapsulated environment uh, within which we put these tools that you can use. But you can also go and do things in the cloud. Amazon, Google, Microsoft all have cloud services, which are these encapsulated environments within which you can process things. And there are many tools out there uh, that allow you, Nitrix CE being one of them, that create these containers in the cloud that you can process things with directly online. And NeuroDocker is something that you can use locally. So it's a little bit of a misnomer today because it started off creating Docker files, as you saw in the example, but it can also create singularity files. So it really supports both kinds of the dominant container abstractions that currently exist today. And then the question is, how do we track all of these things? Well, this is where the term provenance kind of comes in. And we don't think about provenance directly unless you're an art dealer or um, somebody who deals with selling art to different places. But the same kind of thing applies to all the things that we're doing. Michael showed a very nice example of how data lad can be used to track what inputs and outputs are generated by a process. And if we think about that step, well, those inputs and outputs are entities. That process that we executed is an activity. And since you all executed that process within your virtual systems, you are all agents helping with executing that process. So the simple frame of reference of thinking about provenance allows you to encapsulate the different pieces. And down the road, different people may look at different components of this provenance. So why should we track information? And this is kind of asking the kinds of things that you may think about doing later on. You may have seen a paper and you want to repeat the analysis. It's really hard to do, but if you tracked your provenance and submitted it with the paper, it's likely that somebody else would be able to repeat that analysis. You might want to reuse analysis on similar data. This is the abstraction component. You can apply the same process to a different data set. Uh, visualize analysis steps. I already showed you two different workflows and you, I could visualize the different components of it. Find software that was used. We've talked about the complexity of workflows. We are looking at different versions of software that are being used, and tracking provenance allows you to track those different kinds of things. Uh, you can query the parameters. You can review and verify the intent. You can reuse part of the analysis, discover related analysis. There's a whole host of things why tracking provenance is important. We tend not to do it because it's complicated. But as you just saw, even using something as simple as data lad, to annotate or record. It's like a recorder, really. And you're recording those things step by step as it goes along. We can then look back into the logs of those things and retrieve all this information in some structured manner. 
So what should we track? I'm going to throw that out as a question. You've done a lot of things today. The history. The history. Okay. What in the history? What has changed? What has changed? Um, so something about the data, perhaps. What else? The scripts as well, so the kind of scripts that you are running. What else? The location. The location, where data are located, so properties of data in some sense. Okay, so I'll put that under the data umbrella a little bit, yeah, but software used. Software used, and what do you think about software used? What in your head is a software? Packages and their versions. Um, what other aspects? If you're using a GUI, there are options. Hopefully, that GUI allows you to record how you're clicking on the GUI. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult to repeat some of those things. And that's one of the biggest challenges with GUIs and the reason why people don't want to rerun things, do things, and why scripting or doing <laughs> scripting things is quite useful. Uh, anything else? Well, there are a few things. So. Actions, I think, covers the GUI clicking bits a little bit. Hopefully, they're tracked. The environment really comprises not just of the top-level software, everything down to the operating system. And we don't always think about that entire stack when we are dealing with this. So how do we track these things? Uh, bash history, you learned about that today. Even at its basic level, that's recording what you did. So that's a good place to start, even if you're not doing anything. Uh, script is another Unix command, which kind of turns on a recording diary. But I would encourage you to move from one to either two or three or both somewhat. Uh, so you'll be hearing a lot more about data lad as you go through the next exercise. I just want to touch on ReproZip a little bit. So ReproZip is a tool not very much unlike data lad in the sense that it captures information, but it actually captures only the pieces of information that were used to process something. So if you think of a package, how many people here are familiar with FSL as a software? Or, okay, most of you. And those of you who don't know FSL likely have used SPM or FreeSurfer or some other tool. And these packages that come out have a lot of software or binaries inside them. So you can not only do BET for brain extraction, you can do GLM analysis or other things. But for any execution step that you use, you're not using all of that software. You're using pieces of it. And you, as you saw when Yarek was talking about paths uh, and how easy it is to perhaps switch the order of where a particular binary is coming from, uh, it's important to know what exactly was used. And ReproZip is a tool which allows you to capture that piece of information. Exercise two deals with using ReproZip. We're not going to do it right now, but since it's all in this document and it's available on your virtual machine, you can deal with it, uh, work with it later on. So at this point, I'm going to stop and I'm going to let Michael take over again and do some GLM analysis. again, um, and we're back um, exactly where we left off. And as um, Satra said, we're, we're going to do, uh, going to do um, a GLM analysis. So to bring you back to the state where we were, we created a data set that contains uh, the imaging data that was given to us in DICOM format, and we generated a bit combined uh, data structure. Now this, uh, as I mentioned it before, if you want to conduct um, a data analysis in a, in a modular way, then this is a useful input to a variety of possible analysis that you could, um, you could, you could run. You can also uh, incre incrementally build uh, uh, on it by you know, acquiring more, um, more scans from different subjects or from the same subject, et cetera. And what we'll do now is we'll, we'll, we'll try to you know, put all the pieces together uh, that, that Satra mentioned and uh, built an actual data analysis that will, will really run and gives you something that, that captures this entire 
uh, provenance information at some level and encodes it uh, at first in, uh, in, in the structure of a data -led data set, which then could be inspected in order to uh, produce a more formal representation of the of uh, aspects of provenance um, in, in, the, in the format that, that Sadra mentioned. So uh, the key bit here, uh, we'll just return to uh, the uh, directory that I made. So we, uh, last time we created um, this localizer scans data set. And th the first key thing to remember is that we want to produce a modular uh, analysis. So what we'll do is we'll create another data set for this step. Now the purpose of this data set is now to capture all the inputs into the analysis, all the computational environments necessary for the analysis, and any custom code that we need for the analysis, and then it will finally capture the outputs of the analysis. So we'll do the same thing uh, that, we, uh, that we did uh, before. By the way, everything here conceptually is just a replication of what we did in the, in the previous exercise. So create data set, add a container, uh, run something, just that the steps are now different because we're doing, uh, the, like the, the very commands are different because we're doing um, um, a GLM analysis using FSL, which uh, seems that most people are familiar with. Did, did the conversion work for, for, for you? Before? Yes, yes. For, for whom didn't it work? Awesome. Would be bad, right? If it's reproducible, supposed to be, it doesn't run. So uh, we'll create. Uh, oops, we create uh, a new data set, which you can name uh, any which way you like. Um, I went for GLM analysis, and of course, it could be more specific if it's you know targeting a specific uh, kind of analysis. So same command as before, and we end up with a, a second folder that is not inside the, uh, the, the localizer scans that we used before. So we enter that folder again, and now uh, you can probably already imagine what we have to do, because now the inputs are no longer uh, raw data DICOMs, but our bits data structure that we created before. So we have to uh, now use the install command again to register that data set that we produced ourselves as an input for this analysis. And it's, it's exactly the same um, um, command that we ran before. Put this up here. Just that the locations changed. So install, we want to add this to the data set that we're in. Remember, the dot is a um, symbol for referencing the, the current directory. But this time, our source is not someplace on the web, on, on, on some server or you know, workstation or anything. It's just one directory up the, um, the data set, which we call localizer scans. So we can also reference local resources um, without any issues. And we'll follow the same convention that we, that we used before and put this input data in a folder called inputs, and we call it raw data again because it's still the same raw data just in a, in a different format. But of course you can uh, decide to use other names. So what it did now is it made a copy. And there are many options that we, we, we are not going uh, through right now for time reasons, but you can make that copy real cheap. So for those of you who know what hard links is, you can instruct this command to hard link things so it won't it won't use uh, you know, duplicate uh, storage space. It's really fast. But the point is that now on your file system, you made sure that you do not modify the original um, a bits data file. So there is no accidental modification by you changing files randomly, trying things around. So you have your original uh, data set uh, in, a, in a nice and secure location. And we have an independent copy now in data let sub data sets as a sub data set in inputs raw data. And now the, the, the following uh, command is the most obscure in the entire thing because we'll do the Jedi mind trick and run the following command. Data let run procedure set up Yoda data set. That's not a joke. It should actually run. It ran. Um, what this thing does, it, it sets up a particular configuration for that data set so that we, we track custom code, which we'll do in a second, 
uh, in Git as it would track any other data set, but track large files in a Git annex thing. And it applies a set of conventions um, that if you, you know, like them, this thing will automatically uh, um, take care of for you. If you want to learn more about that, you can, you can come to the poster um, 2046. It's not the number that is on the, on the uh, um, paper that I have in front of you, um, which, which will, um, which, you know, on that poster you have lots of information of how this organization structure uh, is meant to be. And we think it's quite useful. So now, for those of you who've done an F-cell analysis, you know that we need, uh, we need a, a, a bunch of files in order to do that. So standard GLM analysis, you need uh, information about when the simulation happens, but FSL doesn't understand bits, events, TSV files, so we have to bring them into a, this information, we have to bring it into a form that FSL can understand. Uh, we're going to use so-called EV3 files. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, FSL, these are basically text files that tell you uh, when the simulation started, with what intensity, and how long it uh, how long it lasted, um, and the the other thing that we need to do for an FSL analysis, we need to fill up a text file with all kinds of variables uh, that instruct FSL exactly what kind of analysis you want to run. If you're an FSL user, typically typically what you do is you use the FSL GUI to basically click together in analysis and then save a, a, a file, use that as a template and replace certain variables in them, change the idea of a subject and the number of a run and then you can generate from that one file that you created by hand all the other configurations for all the other scans of, of subjects that you did in your study. And we'll do a similar thing, but we're trying to, to make it re-executable so we have to cut out all the manual steps so the machine can do uh, everything because it's hard to capture the click on the, on the, on the button. So um, first thing we do is we add uh, the, the necessary information to that data set that we just created in order to capture all the inputs. Datalet uh, has a command uh, called download URL, which I will copy paste. So the, the interesting bit is download uh, URL, that's the command. And we want to download the all the content from the list of URLs that we're giving uh, at the end into a folder called code. And if you, if you look at those URLs, what you can see is we're basically downloading scripts that are provided in some repository on GitHub. So I'll, I'll just copy that in and we'll see what happens. It will obtain those files from the URLs. You can see downloading from this and that into code. And now we have a code folder that contains our scripts. And because we, we set it up using this Yoda procedure, we can actually inspect uh, the, the history and we'll see that the content of these files ends up being tracked in Git, like in, in any situation where people would use Git as a, as a version control system for, for software development. So now we have uh, two scripts in code. Let's look at code. Ah, let's look at code. Uh, we have this template file with the FSL uh, configuration that I managed that you would have created manually in, 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 in some sense. And we have a script that can convert the events TSV files from bits into the format that FSL expects. And now we run that converter to create the input files uh, for FSL and we can use the, the data let run command again. And we're using run again, we could just run the code in that script, but if we would do that, we would generate files that in the history of that data set would look like they would come out of thin air. We could have typed them in by hand, which is not the case, we're generating them from inputs. And if we want to have the full provenance capture of the entire analysis, we want to make a record that we uh, executed that code. So uh, executing that code would basically look like a bash name of the script, um, this script is written so you have to give the ID of the subject that it, you're generating these things for, and then you would list the inputs. And the corresponding data light command looks pretty much like it, uh, but as before, we are giving it an information what is input and what is output of those commands, because there is no, uh, um, maybe Sutter will talk about it later, it's, it's quite an expensive step to 
figure out automatically what a command needs as input and as output. And we are basically doing a shortcut here and, and just giving it explicitly. So we'll run that, it will take no time, and you will see that from that events TSV file that we copied in the last uh, section, we created those, um, those input files. And they look, they look very simple, we'll look at one. Um, and those who've seen uh, FCL EV3 files, they will say, yeah, this looks like an EV3 file. So first column is onset, second column is duration, both in seconds, and the third column is an intensity value that the FSL supports. And now we have all the inputs. Um, the only thing that we need still is, is FSL. And um, it has been talked about at length before how important it is to know exactly what version you're using. And it's not just version of FSL that you're interested in. You're interested in every version of every software and library that FSL depends on, which is a long list. Um, so we, we, we save ourselves from, from doing that by using a container. And there is a container for you uh, at the, this uh, Singularity uh, Hub URL, but as before, to save time on, time, uh, on, on, on downloads, we're making a shortcut and using, using a, a copy of that container, which is um, already in the, in the VM. So we did the same thing as before. We containers add a container image to the data set under the name FSL which contains FSL, and as uh, Dorota showed before, we could you know, execute FSL commands like bet in that container without having to have FSL installed uh, on the host system. And you can convince yourself that uh, there is an FSL container by using the containers list command again. And now we are, we are basically ready for, for analysis, and uh, Datalet, like Git, has a way to, to tag uh, stages in the history of a data set. So here we do data let's save version tag and we call this thing ready for analysis. So we can reference it under that name. So if you look into the history, you can see that it puts, puts these, these tags as labels onto particular stages. So you can give meaningful names that are better than just states in the data set. And now uh, that's it. So we've, we've repeated the step that we did before. We created an empty data set. We referenced all the inputs that are required for an analysis. We referenced a computational environment that has the software tools that we, that we, um, we, we need to use. And now we're tailoring that template script for FSL for one subject. So who knows what the, the said editor is? Not many. So if I, I can show you that, uh, that um, template script. This, uh, can I make this bigger? No, this I cannot make bigger, but it's, it's not necessary. So you can, you can see it has lots of files that are automatically generated by FSL. The only thing that I did is I labeled the paths uh, that are needed. FSL needs absolute paths in there. Um, for any particular subject with those placeholders. And now the, the set command is an editor that can modify um, text files without me having to actually type something in. So this monster of a command here does nothing else but going through those placeholders and replacing them with the folder that we are in and the name of the subject that we want to convert. And we put all that through the data let run command and we'll inspect what the output will be, and Datalet will tell us what it, what it did. We get this thing, which is the tailored uh, template file for, for this command. So now this has the actual uh, uh, folder name and the, the, the subjects. So now this is a complete setup, and now we just have to uh, execute this. Um, in FSL, there's a tool called feet, and the only thing you have to give it as an argument is the, uh, the, the setup script, basically, where it has all the variables uh, with all the choices that you have in, an, in a GLM analysis, what kind of preprocessing, et cetera, uh, encoded in it. So it's the complete description of that um, analysis. And what we'll do is we'll use daylight containers run with the FSL container 
to run this thing. And we give it a slightly more elaborate description of what are the inputs um, and the, the outputs in order to capture uh, this information. By the way, this inputs and outputs thing uh, is not required for daylight run or containers run. It's just there to give a comprehensive description of what this command does. And it will help you uh, achieve uh, the ability to automatically re-execute these things, which we'll, we'll see at the very end. So we run this now. And on my computer, um, this takes about four to five minutes. So in yours, it might take, it might be faster or slower, depending on, you know, when you bought your laptop. So um, do you want to do the repo zip? Do we have time still? Otherwise, I'll just preempt the result and we look at the, what would happen at the end. Yeah? Okay? Okay. So I prepared um, the, the output or the outcome of this. So just to mention it, right? So what you see here in, uh, after this, this line, this is FSL talking. And it will it tell us we could go to that place and inspect the results. But it, the command is still running. And for the time being, we will look if I can manage. I'll take another terminal and go to a place uh, where I have the results already prepared. By the way, this is, I, I got those uh, from a repository that is linked from the key point section here. So there's a link to it. And you can data let install that thing and it will give you the exact output of what, of, of uh, what, what you are all uh, computing right now. And I, I data let installed that before so we can, we can look at a few things. So for example, that this is the GLM uh, data analysis repository. So it still knows that there is inputs data and it also has knowledge containers of the container that is there. Although contain, oh, sorry. Uh, source activate section two. There we go. So it still has the, the container. This is where the container lives in the data set. So we can, we can uh, actually go into the, um, into the, where we are in the data set and we can ask git annex where it is. You've seen that before. And we can, we can check whether it knows. And uh, as promised, um, it knows that the image is actually available from Google's cloud uh, um, storage system. So anybody who has data installed that data set from GitHub has access to that image. They don't have to do the entire setup procedure, et cetera. And that will also work uh, even if Singularity Hub goes away uh, as long as that uh, storage unit is, is still there. And anybody who has installed it locally has a copy of that and if you push that anywhere and tell, tell Datalite about it, then there is you know, permanent storage pretty much through uh, crowdsourcing. So, and now we can, we can simply, oops, we can, please, please let me look at the history. So this is the, the, the output <coughs> and we ran this command with feet so this is the, the, the record of what we typed into the command line. And then it has captured all these things. This is the, 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 entire, the entire output of file list that FSL produces. And it, it's not scrolling nicely for me. So there, there are a few more. So in the, the last bit I want to show you, um, which you can do uh, at home to, to prove it is the entire demonstration was done um, with the purpose of producing a recomputable analysis. But we haven't shown that yet, right? So the, uh, for, for the, the complete uh, picture, I need to introduce you to the so-called rerun command. So rerun is the thing that can inspect all these run records uh, that data like created and re-execute them. 
So this command, uh, which maybe you just copy in here and make a little bigger. That's maybe too big. You can you can tell it uh, to to re-execute everything since we made that version tag uh, ready for analysis. So all the run records that were made afterwards, we want to re-execute them uh, onto this this tag and create a separate branch. A branch is a is a Git feature where you can have multiple versions of one data set. Uh, next to each other, and we can re-execute that. And because we specified all the inputs and outputs, um, it is able to download all the necessary input files from their converted stages, etc., and put them in the right places for FSL to pick them up and re-execute uh, the, the thing. So if you if you run that, uh, you can you can follow these uh, commands and use another a command called git diff, which allows you to compare these two flavors, the original execution and the re-execution, and the outcome will show you that there have been no changes to any files, in, in particular to the ones that have the, the GLM statistics. The only changes between the branches will be files that contain timestamps and paths, because you re-executed the analysis uh, at, a, at, a, at a different stage. So with this kind of setup, you get you know, full modularity of um, the, of, of any analysis that you can conduct because you're limiting it to one step of the analysis per data set so you can reuse those features and you can also recompute uh, and you can get access to all the uh, previous steps just from the latest data set that you might have published together with your, your publication. So in this case, if you go to uh, this URL, you'll see what it is and we can access all the, the, the sub data sets using the data like get command that you've you've seen before. Now let's check um, where it is. So it, it finished for me. And you can see all the, uh, the, the files that it produced and now has produced a similar record as the one that we've we've published before. So one tiny last bit, uh, we can also um, use the modularity of the analysis to save on uh, archiving and backup costs. So du is a command that tells you how, how large uh, the, the output of a command, uh, how, how large the content of a, uh, of a folder is. So we have our inputs in inputs raw data, if you remember, that's the bit structure data set. But that's a separate data set. We don't need to archive the copy of this one because we use version control to, to know that it's uh, unmodified. So we can tell Datalet to throw this away while actually checking whether there are any changes. So we can use the uninstall command like this to uninstall in this data set that we are in everything that is in the inputs folder uh, recursively if there are multiple uh, things in there. So we can do that and it will it will actually check for all the files in, in an, that are annexed with this git annex tool whether there are enough redundant copies at other locations, regardless of where you got them from, and only throw them away when there are redundant copies. So we, it will prevent you uh, it, from, from doing accidental deletions. And now we, uh, we, can, we can check um, what the size of the data set is, and you see that we removed about 60, uh, 30 megabytes, which is about the size of the, of the data that we had. So the information, though, about this sub-data set is still there. And it has the, the, the notion, and I'll show you that too for, for completion, And it knows precisely what revision of that data set it needs, also encoded as a checksum like, like Git does that. So now it can go back and reobtain uh, that data set for you at that specific version. So if you need to recompute anything, Datalite is capable of, of doing that for you. So even if you, if you haven't seen it you know, firsthand, uh, I remind you that the, 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 the text and the narrative in that lesson is, is 
complete enough so you can go through and, and recompute the entire thing. And if you, you see that you can recompute it yourself, uh, go install the data set from, from Datalad and recompute that one because it it's, uh, represents the state where you're basically replicating somebody else's recorded uh, execution. So with this, you've seen all the tools to go through uh, computational uh, reproducibility or re-executability. I think this is a good way to end. Questions? All right. So I know it's been it's it's been a long day already. Uh, I think you you guys need to uh, like uh, should we stretch a bit and uh, get the uh, get your arms up uh, and start to get the oxygen because you will need the oxygen soon. Uh, we are uh, starting the last bit of the uh, of this course uh, and the last but not the least, uh, it's um, it's going to be a fairly different beast now. Please consider that all the, what you've learned uh, is absolutely, uh, is both cutting edge and both fundamental, right? Uh, it's uh, both cutting edge because those tools are uh, just uh, being built. Uh, I think the, the version that uh, you used of a data lab is, uh, when was the uh, last version that you released? Two hours. Two hours ago. <laughs> so you, you've been using the, the version that have been released two hours ago uh, of, of data lab. So, it really is a cutting edge sort of a, a, a aspect, but it's uh, it's also uh, the, the, the you know the, the principle uh, of data lad and the principle of uh, of the of how you uh, handle the data and the uh, the container and the uh, and those things are completely fundamental and and they are going to stay for a very very long time. So consider that you've learned uh, both the principles and also the cutting edge technology to sort of implement those principles. Now we have. Uh, when we're talking about reproducible research, uh, we are not only talking about being able to relaunch uh, the same workflow on the same data. Uh, we're also thinking, okay, what if I don't have enough data? What, what kind of statistic I'm going to do? And is that statistic going to be reproducible as well? Like, is, that, is that going to give me like a, a strong answer to my question? So, so the computational aspect is fundamental. The statistical aspect is fundamental. Uh, so we are going to have a little quick preview of that uh, uh, statistical aspect with, uh, so Sarah Greenwood is a, a professor in statistics at uh, McGill, uh, and, uh, and uh, she's going to tell you a bit on the, the p-value and power and refresh your memory on those things. And the reason why we think it's important to refresh your memory on, on those things is that despite being <coughs> classical tools, uh, I personally believe, and I think that's a, uh, shown and sh again and again that uh, it, it, these things are still not well understood. Uh, they are still uh, you know, sometimes uh, not, uh, not clear what, you know, what, uh, what are those things and why they are so fundamental and so on. So I think a little bit of motivation, uh, I think a lot of the irreproducibility aspect of science is coming from this uh, reporting of p-value and, and how do we uh, handle those uh, those p-values and how do we compute those p-values with the p-hacking problems and so on. So I think uh, having a bit of refreshment on, on that part is, is really critical. And then uh, I'll talk a bit on the positive positive value and maybe some of you know and some of you don't, but uh, I'll, I'll do a quick uh, quick survey of that. And then maybe if we have time, we'll do a bit more for that. Thanks, uh, JB. So I know it's the end of the day, and I know that you're probably getting really tired. Um, <clears throat> so this will, this will be, as JB said, uh, fairly different. Um, just to start, uh, what I'm going to talk about here uh, in terms of scripts and whatnot, you can find on uh, the GitHub page under section 4.1.
uh, due to a variety of technical challenges, um, this is not going to happen in the virtual box. I think I'm having hardware problems on my own computer, um, compounded with a variety of other things. So these are um, basic slides, um, which you will also, which you are also find on the. Um, sorry about this. <laughs> on the um, <coughs> GitHub page. So I know you guys are all pretty sophisticated in statistics, and so that's great. And I'm, so I'm going to revisit concepts that you should know uh, and uh, just talk a little bit more about them. And at the very beginning of the day, it was said, we want to make sure that if you start with the same data and do the same analysis, that you get the same result, right? And so most of the day has been about that. Start with the same data, do the same analysis. How do we document that? How do we make sure that it is exactly the same? But what statistics is, is of course, uh, talking about uh, <clears throat> what happens if you do a different data set. Um, if you're analyzing, we say in statistics, if you take the same data and analyze it with several methods and you get the same result, that that inspires confidence. Um, and that is always true. But going a little bit beyond that, what happens if you have uh, more than one data set? And when do you make conclusions that are that are are saying you know am I seeing something here that is consistent conceptually it's not going to be exactly the same if it's a different data set of course but what conclusions can I draw from a data set so that's where the statistics comes in right so this is this is the same idea about reproducibility but it's reproducibly in a more general framework so you guys all know what a p value is the probability of observing a statistic equal to the one seen in the data or one that is more extreme when the null hypothesis is true. Um, so let's dissect that a little bit. <clears throat> so I've highlighted a few things here. So um, <clears throat> observing a statistic equal to the one seen in the data. Um, so that is bringing in right away the concept of repeating a study and repeating it in the same way. So the same study design, the same sampling scheme. So. This is really crucial, right? If you want to analyze a data set that was collected in uh, Montreal, where I live, and then you collect another data set in a totally different country in a totally different environment, and you're expecting to see the same result, that's a tall, that's a tall order. There's a lot of things that could be different, not just the uh, fact that the study participants are coming from a different place, but also the whole way that study design was conducted. So when you're talking about repeating a study, you really have to think hard about whether or not what you're going to get out of that is going to be reproducible. Um, what has changed in the study design? What has changed in the sampling scheme? What has changed in the original data that is underlying? Now I've highlighted in blue um, the statistic. So if you're going to talk about reproducibility, you have to have a statistic. I mean, sometimes we forget about this. Um, <clears throat> if you're doing a t-test, the t-test is the statistic, and it's, you know, that's fine. But that's not always what we talk about when we talk about a statistic. Sometimes the analysis that you're doing involves a very complicated workflow. And so your statistic is actually uh, some kind of summary measure that involved a certain amount of filtering or a certain amount of normalization or a certain amount of data reduction or dimension reduction, um, a certain amount of, you know, deciding that I didn't like that observation. So when we talk about a statistic, all of that is built in. If you change any of those assumptions along the way, then you can't interpret your p-value anymore. <clears throat> And then, of course, the third element that I want to highlight here, and, and I've highlighted this in green, when the null hypothesis is true. So, so of course, you have to know what your null hypothesis is. And uh, again, this seems very straightforward and, and something that you probably all understand very well. But if you have a very complicated workflow going on, sometimes it is a little bit uh, difficult to figure out where your null hypothesis really should be. So, um, <clears throat> again, I'm just going to highlight a couple of points here. So we know what um, p-values are. 
Um, let's say we have a statistic that has a nice normal distribution. And um, we know that the p-value is the area under the curve, and you've seen these in your basic stats courses. So if I have a statistic of one, um, is this visible? It's not visible. Oh not visible, okay, but on the right-hand side in yellow, then I have a p-value of 0.159 for being the area under the tail. If I have a statistic of negative 1.96, that's your standard uh, um, uh, tail value that we often use for a 5% significance level, so the area under that curve is 0.025. Those ideas of area under the curve, they are not restricted of, to the fact that that was a normal distribution. I can define similar tail p-values for any distribution. So here I've done exactly the same thing for a, gamma for a gamma distributed statistic. So I don't need the normal distribution, right? I can define p-values for any distribution. If, and it's always true for any distribution that a p-value should have a uniform distribution under the null. And um, <clears throat> that's the definition of a p-value. Um, this is a, for me, this is really quite a fundamental concept that sometimes gets lost, and this comes back to your choice of statistic and, your, you know, and really understanding what the null hypothesis is, because when those things go wrong, then the null, the null distribution is not going to be uniform anymore. Um, the QQ plot is a tool that is extremely useful for figuring out whether you've got things right. So, does your, do your p-values really have um, uh, the right distribution under the null? So if you have a whole series of test statistics coming from different data sets or coming from some, somewhere where you can get independence, then you can look at these QQ plots. This is just a plot of observed p-values on the y-axis, except I've done a log 10 transformation on them, against the uniform distribution on the x-axis, again, after a log 10 distribution, uh, transformation. So when I do um, uh, a QQ plot and it follows the diagonal line, then I know that the p-values I have follow the uniform distribution as I would expect. Um, if I have some p-values that are uh, popping out at the top, smaller, remember that the negative log 10 transformation here, smaller than I would expect, then those ones might be interesting. So this is a very nice tool to be used in this context. So the point I'm trying to make here is We've talked about reproducibility in a technical sense. Reproducibility in the statistics sense is the idea of being able to make an inference. I see something in my data. <clears throat> um, I want to know whether the result I saw in that data is in any way transferable to the next set of data that I want to collect. So can I make inference? Can I go from the result I see today to the result that I see tomorrow? Uh, and this idea of making inference is tied to the p-value and tied to the testing process that happens. If you have deviations from that uniform distribution, then what's going on? Is it because I've made some, um, it, it, is it because there's something that's really exciting? Okay, that's obviously one possibility. <laughs> but the other possibilities have to be kept in mind. Have I done something to the data along the way, which means that the null distribution is no longer what I think it is. Do I really understand what the statistic is that I'm using? Do I really understand the sampling procedure and the population from which I've drawn the data? So that was all the null hypothesis. Now, of course, the flip side of that is whether there's something that follows the alternative hypothesis. Is there something real in the data? Is there some true association? Um, so this comes into the idea of power. Um, <clears throat> and we've, as I'm sure you've seen before, we have two errors we often talk about with uh, power. We have the sort of type one error, the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it's true. And then we have the type two error or the beta, which is the probability of not rejecting the alternative hypothesis when it's false. And power depends on a few different factors. It depends on those two errors, depends on what you choose for alpha, what you choose for beta, and it also depends on the sort of separation between your the distribution of your statistic under the null and the distribution of your statistic when the null is false. So 
<clears throat> here on the right would be, let's say, a, a distribution of the statistics under the alternative hypothesis. The red area is power. The blue area is type 1 error. And so you're going to have more power when the two curves are further apart. If I take a really simple example, which is just the t-test, you know, the standard t-test for comparing two groups, you compare the two means, you divide by a standard deviation. When is the power going to vary? If the means are further apart, that means the numerator is bigger. <clears throat> it's also going to vary if the standard deviation uh, is also going to depend on the standard deviation. Smaller standard deviations will make that statistic bigger. Larger sample sizes will make that statistic statistic bigger. So power depends on all those things. Now, what I was going to do now is to ask you in the side of the virtual box to start our studio and run some scripts. Um, you can do that, of course. The um, R commands are, are located inside the uh, set of scripts that are provided for you. R studio and R are both installed. Um, technically speaking, given the time of day, I was actually thinking what I would do is just do it here and you guys can um, try it uh, on your own time if you, if you so wish. Um, so what we have here is a small data set, <coughs> phenotypes.csv. And how many of you have actually run R before? Almost everybody, that's great. All I want to do here is talk a little bit about sampling variability. <clears throat> Basically, what I'm doing here is I'm uh, reading in the data, grading some histograms of it, and then I'm going to sample from, this is just a couple of variables in the data set. The top one, the top left is, um, uh, a volume, a cortical volume. Uh, we have a, an age variable. Um, we have a, a score, PHX. Jean, you remember what that is, JB? Some okay. <clears throat> but I want to talk about sampling variability. So this is a data set that has a thousand people in it. But what I'm going to do is create a small subsample that only has 30 people. And we can analyze this, and I can look at um, the size of the coefficients in the p-values here. For example, I have a coefficient of negative 0.9 and a p-value of 0.98. So I have almost no relationship there. Is that something that I would have expected to see, or is that something that I would not have expected to see? That's, if I sample only 30 people from, I'm only going to get, uh, I'm not going to have a very much um, power, right? Because the sample size is really small. And I also might have quite a bit of variability from one set of 30 people that are sampled to another set of 30 people that are sampled. And so what you have in this script here is a code, if you ever want to try it, to sample 30 people analyze it and get a result. Sample 30 people, analyze it and get a result. I've written it as a function. What I'm going to do is then just sort of go back to my PowerPoint and show you what happens. <clears throat> so here th there were 35 people registered for the course, so I, I did that 35 times. And there were two variables in the data set that I was uh, focusing on. One of them was called uh, gender. Uh, and there really is an association. It, it's just taking its time. It'll, it'll come up in a sec. Uh, there really is an association between this cortical volume and, and gender. And those are the uh, red dots, okay? And these are p-values. And this is a QQ plot. Another variable in the data set was called mystery. The idea was to see if you could see an association. But let me give away the story. There is no association with mystery. And so those are the blue dots. So. Look at the p-values the p -values are, are ranging. This is, between, this is on the negative log 10, so 3 is 0 0.001. The p-values are ranging from essentially p-values of 1 down to p-values of 0 0.001. And the blue dot range, um, they're not quite as large as in the red, but there's a lot of variability. I'm really spanning the spectrum here across these 30 points. I find this plot perhaps even more interesting. 
So again, the y-axis is the p-value with the negative log 10 transformation. And the x-axis is the actual slope coefficient. These are just simple linear models. Huh? The, so these are the slope coefficients. So look at the slope coefficients for the um, red dots, which are gender. They are, there's a huge variability there going from almost zero all the way up to 500. It's the same data set. I have done random sampling of 30 people, and I've done it 35 times. So don't forget about the importance of sampling variability. Sampling variability is huge. This is a really big difference from one data set to the other. And I haven't injected any bias. You know, when we actually go out and collect study, collect participants for study, there's bias involved there. There's no bias here. This is a nice random number generator doing the sampling. Even when there's nothing going on in the blue dots, I'm getting a lot of variability from negative to positive. And you might say, well, sample size of 30, that's really small, right? What if I do it with a sample size of 100? <coughs> so now I've got the QQ plot on the top. OK, I've got more power. Sample size is 100 now. So all of those red p-values are, are small. They're all way above the diagonal line, which is this diagonal solid line. So I've got a lot more power. The p-values are smaller. But if I look down at this volcano plot, I'm still getting huge variability in the actual estimated coefficients of the strength of the association between gender and, and the cortical volume. Um, if I go to 250, I'm still getting quite a lot of variability. If I analyzed all, there was 1,000 people in this data set. If I analyzed them all, I would have ended up with um, a coefficient uh, about 115, Okay, so somewhere in the middle of the pack there. So you're still getting a lot of differences between estimates in sampling variability. Uh, so this is uh, uh, something I was asked to show, just uh, a comment about a survey for the, um, for the course. But I, this course is not done. JB is now going to come up and talk about uh, positive predictive value. But some questions? <clears throat> Remember that, uh, like the uh, the group of thirty is basically the uh, the average uh, group in fMRI, right? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's not a crazy number uh, that we see in uh, in your imaging. Yeah. Some people actually use like maybe 16 uh, subjects, right? <laughs> We've seen 16. Um, so I apologize in advance because the, uh, it is late in the day and uh, I think we're all jet lag and tired. And I'm going to show you a couple of uh, math uh, figures. So that's, uh, that's going to be tough uh, for me as well. Okay, so, uh, so maybe the first thing I'd like you to do is uh, to uh, make sure that you have the latest version of the, uh, of the GitHub repo. Uh, uh, and so if you go into your uh, virtual machine and go into uh, a section, where am I? Uh, into section four. Oh. 
and if you uh, just down, just uh, uh, pull the uh, the latest version, well, I'm just going to uh, uh, make in, make practice of uh, what you've learned a little bit before. Uh, so that section to okay. So uh, so the our GitHub repo uh, again. I think you have cloned it already in that in that machine, right? Is the uh, GitHub repo name, and then OHPM uh, OHPM training. Okay, so if you uh, clone or download that GitHub repo, uh, get that in the uh, in the virtual machine, and then maybe uh, uh, what we do is uh, so I'm going to deactivate. Uh, Deactivate the section two uh, uh, conda environment. Activate and then uh, source activate uh, the conda environment that is the um, uh, for section four. What's it called? What's it called again? Is it section four? Hmm? Section four, right? All right, uh, and then maybe going into the workspace and then git clone uh, this uh, uh, this uh, GitHub repo. All right. Oh, so because that's a vagrant machine, I think we need. Uh, that's because yeah. yeah, that's right. So let, uh, let me get the HTTP uh, directly from here. Thank you. So, uh, so that's going to just to uh, make sure that you have that uh, GitHub repo and within that GitHub repo there is a uh, uh, there is a couple of a, a Jupyter notebook, uh, and uh, with that environment, you should be able to run those notebooks. Um, so I'm going to just go to the uh, the first one. Yeah. Right. I don't think we have actually. In, indeed, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we we did, we, uh, we usually. I mean, okay, there's a, a a number of people are very used to working with those. Uh, uh, documents. So Jupyter Notebook, uh, and you have the environment uh, to, you know, like uh, to to create and to uh, uh, to run those documents uh, in the uh, in your um, virtual machine. Uh, but the Jupyter Notebook is uh, well. I'll let me show you. Uh, it's a it's a, an interesting hybrid document that will mix uh, text, uh, possibly LaTeX uh, formulas, uh, as well as a piece of code. Uh, and in this in this specific uh, example, I'm using Python code, but you could have a Jupyter notebook uh, with R code, or you could have Jupyter notebook with a uh, uh, Julia code. And there's about 20 languages uh, that are, uh, you know, so, uh, so that uh, so uh, so if you want to install the Jupyter notebook, just go into onto the web, search for Jupyter uh, notebooks, and you will you will you will be uh, directed to how to install those things. But you have already uh, the uh, Jupyter notebooks installed in the environment that we've provided with the virtual machine. Uh, so, so that's what the Jupyter Notebook looks like. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is, and I can, uh, if I do shift enter, I'm, uh, I'm just executing those cells. So it, it's, a, it's a list of cells. Uh, and you know, that cell, if I go into that cell, if I look at what is there, it's actually uh, just a markdown file that says, okay, this is a one dash, and makes, it says that you know, this is a title. Uh, so, and if I execute that, I have the visualization of that title. Um, so in the same way, if I look at, you know, I, I was looking at uh, making some definition here, making sure that we have uh, on the same page of uh, all those definition, I can write some LaTeX formula here, and, uh, and that will, if I execute that, uh, uh, the Jupyter Notebook will actually render those things as, uh, as formulas. Uh, for the moment, I will just uh, uh, have a, a put uh, those things a, a little bit too much in a little bit nicer place, a nicer way. 
Uh, and the, the, the one thing I would like you to understand is what is the positive politic value and, and why it is important to think uh, of the positive politic value when you're doing your experiment and when you're reading papers that have done experiment. So, uh, so those are the reminders of the definition and we have seen with Celia's uh, talk you know, all those things already. Uh, so I'm going to uh, call power W, and which is one minus the uh, type, uh, uh, the type two error, uh, the false positive one minus the false positive right, uh, and and again the same sort of uh, uh, notation alpha is still the uh, false positive right as usual, uh, and so on, and and maybe the two new notation is that I'm going to call T S the test when it's uh, significant, and uh, and T N when it's not significant. So, so what is the positive pretty value? Uh, I think, I don't know when it was introduced in the literature, maybe Celia, you can help me with that, but uh, definitely it was introduced at least uh, with the UNEDIS 2005 paper, and, uh, and way before. Uh, yeah, when there was uh, Selke and uh, Berger and all those, you know, all those, all those people, but, but, but at, you know, when it came, I think it came a bit into fame for the general public, I, would, uh, I, was, I, was, I meant. Uh, is that you know there was this very famous paper saying why uh, most of the results uh, in, in the, are, are false, and that uh, that paper was you know, taking that positive predictive positive value and, and and showing you know with that uh, 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 statistic what's the uh, what was the problem. So the so what it is it is the probability that your hypothesis on the alternative hypothesis. So the thing you are interested, let's say you want to show uh, some association between. Uh, uh, let's say uh, age and the hippocampal volume, for instance. Uh, let's say that that hap that showing, I mean, telling you know, that, that hypothesis, uh, uh, the probability that the hypothesis is true, knowing that you have uh, a significant result for the, the test that you've done with the, uh, on this association. So let's say I do a correlation, I find a you know nice uh, 0.6 correlation, and that's uh, maybe that's a uh, you know p-value of uh, 0.01. What is the probability that the, this uh, alternative hypothesis is true given that I have a significant result? Uh, so it's a bit of a weird thing to ask uh, because you, you have to think of, of a hypothesis in terms of uh, random things. So it's a bit of a, or, or at least to, you know, like a, a large set of hypotheses and, and, and you're thinking, okay, I'm, I'm going to uh, take that, uh, that uh, you know, alternative hypothesis and, uh, and thinking, okay, what's the probability that it, it is true? Uh, so it's a bit of a, you know, you have to uh, change a bit of a, this, your set of mind if you are uh, usually uh, using uh, hypothesis as uh, non-random things. But, uh, but in, in that case, we're going to say, okay, uh, there are many, many alternative hypotheses possible and some of them are true and some of them are not, right? And this is, this is the, the, the mindset uh, that we are taking. So, uh, so I'm going to try uh, in the next five, 10 minutes, so bear with me. It's going to be a little bit uh, sort of uh, maybe not uh, that easy, but I'm going to try to tell you uh, what is the positive predictive value? How do you derive the positive predictive value from simple uh, principles, statistical principles? Uh, and the first, uh, the first uh, thing that I would like you to, show, to, to see is that the, uh, let's say let's say you have also the, the that I mean the probability of the test being significant is just uh, uh, it's just the probability of the test being significant uh, and we we are uh, under the alternative plus the probability of the test being significant and we are under a zero I mean that's that sounds simple in a sense because you know it's, we are either uh, the, uh, on the alternative or the uh, the uh, or, uh, or the uh, the null hypothesis right there's no uh, there's no overlap. It's a uh, two different uh, independent uh, uh, event. Now, um, so remember that, that you know, we can write that uh, probability as uh, the sum of those two uh, things, one, uh, one under the null, one under the alternative. And then, uh, and then uh, you probably all know the Bayes theorem, uh, and that's uh, uh, very famous. So which states that the, uh, the probability of two, the uh, two event, A and B, uh, is the uh, probability of A knowing B times the probability of B, right? And then if you rearrange things, you can you know, uh, compute the probability of A knowing B uh, or the probability of B knowing A uh, use, you know, with, the, uh, with this, uh, this, um, uh, these, these probabilities, these marginals, uh, the um, conditionals. So, uh, and there's a nice uh, little uh, uh, explanation of, of, the, uh, of what is the base theorem, base theorem here. Uh, so if you like, let's say you have some spam, let's say you have uh, in the spam uh, the word free lunch, 
uh, it was used to be some uh, other word, but anyways. Um, and then the uh, this, the the, uh, the, th the you know the events that are both the uh, spam and the word free lunch are you know the intersection, uh, and then the probability of a so let's say spam knowing that uh, we have free lunch in the in the text of the uh, of the email is just normalized by the probability of the uh, of the of the free lunch uh, so the, the, this area. So it's just normalization. Uh, so it's the probability, the you know, probability of the two events normalized by the probability of the um, of, of one, and you can write it in uh, in use, use, again using the uh, the conditionals uh, here. So uh, so you can think a bit of the, that uh, base theorem. It's not uh, it's not that too complicated to understand using this uh, this kind of a graphics and uh, the frame, frame diagrams. So now you can apply that to our question. So. So we have uh, we've seen the probability of the test being significant, all right? And we can write that probability using the Bayes theorem, using uh, the uh, you know so so probability of the uh, uh, test being significant and H A uh, and the alternative, and that's probability of the test being significant, knowing that uh, we are under H A times the probability of H A, and the same thing for the uh, for the null for the probability under the null. So that's uh, that's easy. So the probability of uh, HA knowing that we are uh, on the a test that is significant, we just rewrite it with the uh, with the base theorem, and that's uh, that's easy as well. And then we expand the the normalization uh, term here, which is the probability of uh, the test being significant, as we've seen before, like uh, using the. Uh... Okay, so we we seem to have a complex formula here, right? But you know all those uh, elements were kind of uh, easy, right? There was n there was no uh, you know very hard, uh, complicated. Uh, you know, it's just like replacing with a simple uh, uh, the, the base theorem, this uh, uh, this addition of those two properties, and that's it. And you've replaced those things in that formula, and that that's that's basically it. So this so no, now I think if you go back to that document, if you read carefully those lines. You yourself will be able to derive that. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's, it's. It's not uh, far away. Uh, all right. So now we look at that uh, sort of a, a big term here. So we got the probability of uh, the test being significant on the H F and times the probability of H A. Uh, but the probability of the test being significant on the H A, it's uh, it's obviously one minus the probability of the uh, test being non-significant on the H A, and that's the, our power, right? Uh, so we've got that term, uh, we know that term. And then uh, the probability of, uh, uh, so that's, uh, so if we rewrite the, 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 uh, this, we have, uh, um, we have this easy uh, uh, formula. So now we have uh, uh, something which looks like the power times the probability of HA divided by the power times the probability of HA plus uh, uh, alpha zero, the um, risk of error, and because that's here, that term here is the probability of the uh, test being significant on the H0, right? So that's easy. And now if you, uh, so that's, we have simplified that very much. We've got the, the power, we've got alpha, and then we've got the probability of uh, HA, if, and the probability of H0. So if we just divide, uh, if we take the odd ratio, so let's say we have a, a probability of H0 divided by the probability of um, HA divided by H0. So th that's the odd ratio, so that's the, uh, the uh, the ratio of how likely the hypothesis that you are testing is going to be true compared to the null, right? So the, uh, that probability, sometimes you are testing something which is a bit, uh, you know, unlikely, and that, that uh, ratio should be small, and sometimes you are going to test something that is fairly likely, and that ratio is going to be large, right? So, uh, so that's, the, uh, that's what the, uh, the, uh, the, the classical odd ratio uh, that you, you probably have seen uh, uh, somewhere in some, uh, in some uh, publications already. So that, now we have a very simple formula. The probability of HA being true, uh, knowing that the test is significant, is power multiplied by the odd ratio divided by power multiplied by odd ratio plus alpha. So now you can think of that formula and, uh, and, and again, there was, there was very little derivation before, right? It was a, it was a very simple sort of like a, a derivation. Now we can think of that formula. What, what's, what's happening? What is, when is that number going to be small and why is that number going to be big? Uh, well, uh, if alpha is very, very small compared to that product, the W times R, uh, to the, the road ratio, then if we, if we have that, then the probability of HA knowing that the test is vegan is going to be high. It's going to be close to uh, to one, right? Uh, 
But if alpha is uh, kind of a small compared to this, this, this product, then obviously this probability is going to, uh, to, go, to go down. So it's really uh, a question of what is my risk of error of type one compared to uh, something which is the product of the, um, of the, of the power and the, and the odd ratio, right? That's a very, it's kind of amazing with like a simple uh, uh, statistical uh, principles and uh, with uh, like a, so Bayes theorem, uh, you know, like uh, uh, using like a you know, very, uh, very, very simple uh, uh, statistics, or then you, you get that, that's, uh, I think that's a very interesting formula. So now, um, so how do we, uh, I mean, uh, I think the exercise now that I would like you to do is, uh, can you go uh, in your uh, the preferred tool? It could be R if you are uh, you're happy with R. It could be some uh, other things. And I, would, I, I wanted to you to actually uh, implement that little formula and, and see what's happening when you have low power and when you have a uh, low odd ratio and when you, what's, when, what's happening when the, uh, the, the alpha is going to, uh, to change. So uh, given that the time is, uh, is a bit tough, I mean, I'm just going to show you what, what it looks like uh, in, the, in the actual in the notebook. So let me uh, run that notebook. So this is just to uh, uh, show again the, uh, the, same, the same thing. It's a bit more, more uh, sort of, uh, uh, developed, but you know, it's, uh, it's easy. So this is here a, a simple function to uh, compute the uh, positive predictive value, okay? Um, and then a simple function to display things. Uh, and then I'm, I was going to take the, uh, the example from a, a button et al, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, I think it was uh, 2013, uh, uh, is estimating the power of uh, studies in neuroscience and showing that the, the average or the, the median power in uh, neuroscience is actually uh, between 0.3 and 0.4. I think that was the, the result of but uh, They looked at all the, those meta-analyses and look at the, uh, the power of the, uh, of the actual analysis inside the, uh, the, those meta-analyses and they, uh, they, they, they found out that uh, the, uh, the power was, you know, like, uh, I think, yeah, I think uh, if someone remembers, uh, tell me, but I think it was 0.3 or 0.4. It was the, uh, the median power. So basically there are, you know, 50% of the uh, analysis being done in the uh, uh, in neuroscience uh, that have uh, less than uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.4 uh, power, right. so power is uh, is is uh, was it was deemed or it was found to be very very small uh, in general. So uh, so let's say, let's take some uh, uh, some examples. So let's say we have a um, an odd ratio of one over five. So it means that the probability of the uh, alternative is. Uh, is, uh, uh, is maybe something like 20 percent compared to, uh, or, uh, to the probability of the null. So, so you know, it's not uh, uh, it's it's a not very likely hypothesis, but it's not a very unlikely hypothesis. So it's something which may be very interesting to test, right? Um, and then let's say that uh, the power our power is just maybe 0.5, or let's say take the uh, example of a of a of a um, uh, button et al. And then your, our alpha is usually 0.45 uh, alpha, right? So with that odd ratio, uh, with that power, and with, the, uh, with that alpha, we've got the, uh, the, the probability of uh, the alternative to be true, given that we have a significant uh, result, a significant test, is about 0.6. So about two thirds, uh, we have two thirds of a chance that this is the alternative is, is basically true. But two third, one third, it's, uh, it's, it's not a great number, right? So this, it means that it's going to be like a, if using, if that, those numbers are correct, uh, you know, it means that 30% you know, of the, uh, of the uh, publications are, well, are going to be uh, like a, uh, describing uh, results that are probably uh, uh, not true. So, uh, so now, uh, if you vary uh, the power, let's say, uh, 0.4 is uh, actually, uh, you know, like uh, it's, it's uh, optimistic. And that's actually uh, like half of the, the studies that have a power of less than that. Uh, so let's, uh, let's vary the power between, uh, and uh, let's look at what, uh, uh, with the same, um, uh, make sure that I, I take the same parameters. Uh, so power is varying. This is a, a little bit of a, 
so maybe the odd ratio is 0.2, so let's, uh, let's make it, uh, okay. So with an odd ratio of 0.2, with a, uh, an alpha of uh, 0.05, and this is what look the, the positive positive value would look like. So uh, if you have like a very low power, but uh, 0.2, 0.3, uh, there's half a chance that your, uh, your, your hypothesis uh, is going to be uh, uh, untrue, even though your test is significant. Uh, and the same, in the same way, you can look at varying the, uh, the odd ratio, of course. Uh, see if, you, if your hypothesis is actually very unlikely uh, uh, with, the, uh, with a power of 0 0.4, 0 0.5, let's say. You know, in this example, let's take the medium of Breton et al. Uh, and then this, this is going to be the... Uh, uh, what you get from the uh, uh, from the from the curve. So basically, with a an odd ratio of a, of a, an unlikely hypothesis, again, uh, you get you know the uh, two thirds of a chance with uh, you know that the, uh, the hypothesis is uh, untrue. And the last thing that uh, the last uh, number that uh, can vary in that formula of OCD is the risk of uh, error. And if you look at this risk of error uh, and you vary that risk of error again with the uh, a power of uh, maybe 0.5, um, uh, then with a, a 0.05, uh, you, know, you also have like this kind of a, a number, of the, uh, um, the sort of a, uh, not too great uh, uh, probability of uh, the alternative being true. The problem with that uh, sort of uh, analysis, uh, first of all, there are several problems. Uh, first of all, it's very hard to estimate uh, the odd ratio. Let's say you're, you're, you're trying to test whether the, uh, the hippocampus of the, uh, uh, the size of the hippocampus is linked to, to uh, maybe gender or age. How do you estimate whether that uh, hypothesis is actually unlikely or not compared to the, the fact that the, you know, it's not linked? Uh, so that's one, one problem. Uh, I think it's, it's, although it's hard, uh, it's also uh, useful to, uh, uh, to, to look at the range of things or a range of estimation and say, okay, I don't have a good number, but I'm, I'm, I can actually look at you know, whether, if that was a very unlikely hypothesis, what kind of, a, what kind of a result I would get for the PPV? And if I was a likely hypothesis, what would, what would be the number? So I think looking at those, those range of numbers uh, is actually better than not, you know, not having any information. I mean, uh, that's, a, that's one thing. The second thing is that uh, I've, I've taken alpha equal, equal 0.05. I mean, you know, one could say, oh, but uh, you know, our alphas are much less than that. And that's, that's possible, but that's uh, something that you have to decide in advance, of course. Um, and there's also a, a bunch of, uh, uh, I mean, a, a, a large number of people that are trying to push the, uh, the idea that we should take a, a more restricted alpha. Uh, but at the same time, we know that uh, the uh, you know it's uh, it's very easy to uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, do some kind of p hacking even with uh, even if you don't want to like even if it's not like a, something that you uh, you are really aware of it's just by uh, you know thinking oh I should maybe try to include uh, oh, that uh, that variable or maybe I should uh, you know sort of uh, select uh, only those subjects that are those characteristics or those things and the. And we know that this, uh, this kind of practice that are, uh, are just like, you know, uh, uh, seems a bit uh, uh, not too dangerous when you, when you do them. I mean, we know that they are inflating the, uh, the, the, uh, the risk of error quite uh, heavily. Uh, so if you look at the uh, uh, Simonson and Simon paper, or like if you, you see, you've seen, you, you, you can see that those practices are actually uh, changing the p-values, the, uh, the risk of error of type one, which uh, fairly heavily. So, so let's say the, uh, the p-value is not 0.5, <laughs> 0 0.05, maybe the p-value actually that uh, is seen in a uh, most study uh, uh, could be something which is uh, uh, around uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, even, even, more, even more. In that case, that sort of a, a number, the, the probability of that hypothesis to be true, even though the test is significant, can go very low. Uh, so, so I think, I think it's, a, it's, just a, it's just a nice tool uh, to, uh, to think, okay, okay uh, my, the, the important result is not whether my, uh, si my test is significant. That's not the important result. The important reason is whether my, the, the probability that I'm, the, the, the hypothesis that I'm, uh, uh, the, the alternative hypothesis is likely to be true or not. Uh, and that depends on those um, three parameters, 
the risk of the type one error, uh, error risk, the uh, the power, and the uh, and the likely I mean, and how likely is the hypothesis uh, to be uh, to be true uh, compared to the uh, the, uh, the prior of that. So uh, so I think I will finish that. When when is the actual end of the? Uh, is it four o'clock or is it four past four? Not to me. Hmm? That's past four, but we need uh, we need ten or fifteen minutes to wrap up, right? Okay. Um, okay. So uh, the second. Uh, uh, so any question on the on the PPV uh, on, the, on the positive relative value? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So my question is, what, what's the practical advice then for neuroimagers? Like, what should we be taking away from this when we're either designing our studies or s selecting a sample size? Or well, obviously, the more the better, but. <laughs> Well, I mean, the practical advice is first, uh, do I have uh, a reasonable range of, uh, of uh, prior or, or like an odd ratio? Uh, I mean, if, if I'm, it's basically forcing yourself to uh, define your hypothesis uh, very precisely uh, and forcing yourself to think about uh, the likelihood of that hypothesis, uh, you know, you know uh, the, the prior uh, compared to the no. And if you think, okay, that's a, that's uh, you know like a, maybe maybe there's half and half chance, uh, or maybe that's a, you know, I, or I really don't know. I, I need to look at all the range, okay. Uh, and then you're forcing yourself as well to think okay, about power. Okay, I, I don't really know the prior on those on those things, but maybe uh, I've seen some kind of similar studies, and the uh, and those studies where I've found some uh, uh, some effect size with that sort of number. Uh, um, and sure, I'm not looking exactly at the same thing, but it gives me some idea of what sort of, sort of uh, effect size I might be expecting. So, and again, the, it's, not, it, it's just forcing yourself to uh, try to put some numbers, uh, try to uh, get some first estimate, even if they're off, uh, having an, and, you know, and, and varying those things to see what's the impact uh, on, the, uh, uh, on, 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 the, on the positive predicted value. But and also to think that uh, you know the uh, not take I mean like we 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 still basically a lot take for granted the uh, uh, the result that we find in papers. Uh, so instead of thinking okay that's a significant result, so uh, this uh, the hypothesis the alternative hypothesis is likely to be true. We say no. I mean the hypothesis is not likely is not necessarily likely to be true. It's it you know it it, it depends on 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 power. It depends on the prior. Yeah, I'm just going to add to, the, add to the same thing. We often finish with a p-value and say, oh, the p-value is significant, and therefore I, I'm happy, and walk away. But the p-value being significant is not the end of the story. The end of the story is whether the alternative hypothesis w is really true, and that's what this is. Um, and we don't think about it nearly enough. Well, that's what we really want to know. Have I actually found a true association here? What's the probability that I found a true association? And so this is a far more important parameter, and or for a far more important result, and we rarely, rarely think about it. Yeah, yeah. So basically, I think the 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 the, the most important aspect of that is make you think about it. <laughs> it's a, a, a and also try to get some uh, uh, value in the literature that would support or or or, or not the uh, your, the hypothesis that you're you're testing. The, one of the problems, of course, is that there is a, a tendency for any scientist that who has a, a theory to sort of, kind of cherry pick those papers that are uh, sort of uh, uh, you know, uh, promoting or, like, or su su supporting the theory. That's uh, that's that's one of the uh, of the problem of the problem. The other aspect is the uh, with small power. Uh, when you're getting published, it means that you have uh, a significant p-value because that's the culture uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the in the scientific community at the moment. And uh, a, a small power means that uh, if you're being being published, it probably means that the uh, the effect size is is very inflated. Uh, so the, uh, if you're only selecting those uh, uh, low-powered studies uh, studies that are uh, significant, you're going to have a, a, a very large inflation of the effect size. So you're you're, you're probably going to estimate uh, that you know you're uh, you are likely to find some result. I mean, you're going to overestimate your power. You're going to overestimate the the, the effect sizes, and, and, and so that's uh, that's another um, a problem that we have to think about. But yeah. 
Yeah. All right. So the last thing I wanted to uh, show you briefly, and that's something you can play with, and I'm not going to, uh, uh, is uh, another uh, little notebook somewhere. Uh, so taking the same data set as uh, Celia has taken and uh, working in Python rather than R, uh, but you know, so that you have like a, uh, I'm just going to read using pandas to uh, to read the uh, the, uh, the CSV file, and then you know maybe you, uh, you want to make sure that your uh, your data set have a, uh, you remove all the null and the, and the nand of the data set, so you're looking at you know what's what's there in terms of a data set, and then some basic statistics and and so all those things. Those things are really important to when you start to work on on data sets. You really have to. Uh, sort of uh, uh, do the graphs that you've seen uh, that Celia has done, or or do uh, check all the uh, you know have all the means of checking that your 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 uh, your data are actually uh, uh, correct. I mean, so you have to look at you know is there a crazy number somewhere? You have to look at outliers. You have to look at you know, missing data. All those things. I mean, um, preparing the data set such that you you're sure that you're not going to use some uh, crazy data or some. Uh, uh, some uh, or do some mistakes is is completely key uh, and uh, sometimes uh, so here I'm dropping the uh, the uh, non numerical value and then I'm looking at the formula uh, uh, using uh, using Python so I'm, I'm I'm going to regress the left hippocampus uh, with uh, age size gender and some some new variables and some uh, the mystery variable that uh, Celia created so I'm, I'm regressing these things. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to use the whole data set for that, uh, for that thing. So I've got uh, almost a thousand subjects. Uh, I had to drop three because of the uh, missing values and things like that. And then uh, the regression uh, uh, formula would be is simple. I mean, the, my left hippocampus is, reg is uh, uh, just a linear model of age, size, gender, uh, those variables. Um, uh, and then I fit, uh, I fit the, the model uh, using a stats model here, and then looking at the, uh, the, the p-value for the, for the edge. What, what is there an association between the, uh, the hippocampus volume and the, uh, and the edge? I don't find any association here. Uh, now, if I uh, say, oh, but uh, you know, those, uh, those mystery and uh, new variables that, have, uh, that have, been, have been there, I don't know, I mean, are they really important? I don't, I'm actually, you know, I've just put that, those things uh, in, the, in the model, but I don't really, probably don't, don't need those things. And then if you look at the, uh, you know, the, uh, the result of that, uh, if you just uh, re recompute your model with like a, a different uh, uh, set of variables, and some, in some studies you have like, a, you know, tens of, of uh, possibly hundreds of variables, right? Uh, and, and then you'll find, you'll find a very, very different uh, p-value, of course, and that, that is because some of those variables were linked to the, uh, to, to the, uh, uh, to edge, for instance. So if you have some correlation between the, in the model, of course, you're going to remove a lot of the variance uh, uh, due to the uh, uh, to that correlation. So, so uh, oh yeah. So I was um, I was going to show you the um, uh, Steve's uh, shiny hub thing, uh, and that maybe it, it's it's a just a nice way of illustrating that problem. Um, uh, so where is that going? So uh, in that uh, little app, uh, all those uh, variables, it, it, this is uh, using the, uh, the, the ping data set. And uh, what we've done here is to look at all the models uh, that are uh, 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 with all the, uh, looking at the, um, uh, the gender coefficient compared to uh, on the, uh, um, I think it's the, uh, I think it is the hippocampal volume as well, right? Uh, so looking at the effect of the gender coefficient on the hippocampal volume, I've got like a bunch of, uh, of variables that are being collected in this study. I don't know which ones are actually uh, useful or not, and I'm not too sure. So I'm going to make all the models, all the possible models with all those variables. Uh, and this is, uh, this is how you can, uh, uh, you know, uh, look at, you know, okay, if I, if I remove... Uh, uh, Oh, if I, I shouldn't remove uh, sex because that's the actual thing that is tested. Uh, <laughs> but if I if I remove some of those other variables, uh, what what is happening to the uh, to the uh, 
the model fit first one, and what is happening to the effects uh, effect uh, of the uh, effect size that are found here. So in this in, in this instance, I find that there's a lot of models that are found uh, that find uh, like a, almost like a null effect, and there's a lot of models uh, that are found that are in effect of uh, about 500 millimeter. Uh, uh, milliliter for the uh, the change in the in hippocampal volume between the two population, uh, between the uh, uh, um, between the uh, the genders, um, and that's obviously is because when you look at when you remove, for instance, the uh, those variables that are accounting for the uh, uh, for the uh, for the brain volume, then you left with uh, you know those 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 uh, this effect size that is big, and that's because obviously there's a confound variable that you didn't you you don't you're not accounting for properly. And that uh, confound variable is uh, is uh, eating a lot of the, of the variance and therefore of the effect size. Um, so what's interesting here is that in a, uh, you could think of the, uh, the one of the problems that we should think about is uh, we are we're collecting those variables. We don't actually know. Uh, we don't have a, a clear idea of which one are going to be related to the uh, effect that we are looking at. Uh, it's not. It's not. It's not very clear, right? Uh, we could collect, you know, some uh, like uh, you know, some other things, and uh, and then suddenly we, we realize that those things are very related to the uh, to the effect that we are we are estimating, and uh, and therefore the uh, you know the this, this uh, vibration effect on the uh, on on the collection. So so the only way this is going to be useful in the long term is uh, if we uh, accumulate those results, uh, looking at all those uh, variables that have been uh, included or not in the, uh, and the, and this is the only way we can sort of solidify the, uh, the results, uh, is to, to make sure that we, uh, we, uh, we increase the number of things that, that we can test and we, uh, we get a, a clearer picture, which means that we have to uh, collaborate with many, uh, many uh, labs and many, uh, and, and get much a bigger uh, set of data and also a deeper phenotyping aspect. Uh, otherwise, we are, we are going to uh, probably uh, get some uh, 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 wrong results. And we, we are already, but. Uh, so that's uh, just a, a little uh, thing that helps to think about those, uh, this problem, uh, you know, the, uh, how, how viable those, uh, these effects are. JB? Yeah. Just wanna, I wanna add in here. So I in the reproducible research context, right, if you look at the cloud of points there, either the top or the bottom, uh, you have quite a large range of the estimates for the sex effect. If you um, fit all of those models and then you report the best one, of course you're introducing a substantial bias, right? Yeah, by reporting only the best one, you, you have almost by definition picked a biased result. So, when it comes back to recording your scripts, right, you have to record inside your whole history of the analysis the fact that you looked at all of these 55 models and picked the best one. So that anybody who wants to understand the bias that you may have or understand the analysis that you have knows that you looked at 55 models and picked the best one. Right. And there are some uh, model selection procedures, of course, that will tell you, you know, okay, uh, you know, those all those models are relatively uh, equivalent, and maybe maybe those ones are actually uh, uh, much better than uh, others, uh, and you know, and that there's a, a large literature on that on that problem, of course, but but basically being aware of the uh, of the fact that when when we we're exploring data, uh, we should really be exploring data on on data sets that are. Uh, separate from the data where we, from the data set that we are actually testing some uh, proper hypothesis. So splitting the data, uh, making sure that there are uh, some data where you, you actually haven't uh, touched, or or trying to replicate on another cohort uh, that is going to be slightly different, of course, and see how that uh, that result generalizes uh, is is the right way of doing it of doing. But it's it's just uh, much uh, more costly. Uh, so I think uh, yeah, we should have. Uh, Less studies, but more power, powered studies, and more and more carefully, uh, 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 and with uh, many more variables and many more uh, uh, sort of a, a checks uh, on, on the on the models. Uh, I think that's that's all that I wanted to say. Uh, is there is there any other question or question on this? Uh, yeah, please. Uh, in your opinion, would you say that the bootstrapping would help alleviate some of the problem we're reporting? And is there any mechanism within Datalad or other software, FSL, et cetera, that actually help with that? 
I don't think there's a mechanism uh, to do specifically bootstrap in the in uh, in data lab, but you you certainly can. Uh, uh, let's say you have a script that would do some bootstrap and would look at you know what's the effect. Of, so bootstrap would be looking at the uh, you know, some some effect of sampling within your within your sample. Can I you know what's uh, what will be the vibration effect due to the sampling within that cohort, right? Uh, I don't think there's uh, something specific uh, in data lab, but certainly you can uh, you know use this to actually show what is the sampling vibration that you get from a, uh, and that's, that's already useful because that's, uh, that's showing more information that, uh, that's just showing one, 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 you know, one point. You are actually looking at uh, estimating a bit of the variability of your, uh, of your results uh, using Bootstrap. So definitely, yes, Bootstrap, uh, if you can, because sometimes it's, you have, well, sometimes you have to do some jackknife rather than Bootstrap, but, but yes, Using the resampling uh, resampling techniques uh, is is uh, is really important to have some ideas of uh, you know how stable the result is uh, compared to the sample. It doesn't you know go uh, to, uh, up to uh, getting another cohort and looking at you know the, the results on another cohort and uh, it doesn't do that. So so you may very well still be like a bias by the specific cohort that you're uh, you're looking at, but uh, it's it's certainly. Uh, uh, a good thing to do. Uh, yeah, it's costly. <laughs> sometimes, you know, I mean, sometimes it is costly uh, computationally. But uh, it's uh, yeah. Uh, just two comments. Uh, one on uh, accelerate. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what you mentioned about selecting the best, you obviously meet the best model, right? The best R squared, not the best result, correct? So, so to answer this, so I'd say, well, obviously we should never do that, right? Absolutely, yeah. So it's as obvious it, as it may seem, it's, it's, it never, it's never uh, enough to repeat that we should never do such a thing, right? Um, and then commenting on the follow-up question on this and about tools available, and JB mentioned uh, resampling methods in general, and uh, actually, as a matter of fact, FSL has a tool uh, that can do something related to this, uh, mm. which is a tool that I have written, right? Oh, it's nice. uh, Palm, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, specifically for this data set that we're showing here for this example, it would address precisely this situation. So you could run, uh, so have your, your uh, subjects, in this case 997, if I understood right, after excluding three, and then you have many different models that you would like to try on those same subjects. So what you can do is you enter your independent variable as your input data, you enter all your models, however many you may have, mm. can be even be hundreds, uh, uh, your computer is the limit, how, however much memory or, or computational power you have. Mm. Um, and you indicate, you pass a flag, it's a permutation test, so it's a resampling method, therefore related to bootstrap. Um, and what you have to do is, you have to pass a flag telling that you want to correct across all those uh, uh, models that you want. Mm. And there is no magic to this. The correction is based on the distribution of the maximum statistic. Mm -hmm. which is the same correction that we already used to correct across uh, mm -hmm. multiple voxels, right? Mm -hmm. distribution uh, yeah. of the maximum across all the voxels in the brain. So in this case, we would use across all the models. Yeah. So after building the empirical distribution of the maximum across all the models, we get the p-value for all the models, correcting for the fact that you have looked into potentially hundreds of them. And the flag in this case, it's core con mm -hmm. for correction over multiple contrasts, mm -hmm. which encapsulates multiple contrasts within a model and also multiple contrasts across multiple models. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that, that's interesting. Like, uh, so, uh, so in this instance, for instance, you have two to the power of the number of variables uh, model, uh, and that's uh, you know, and, and you could like uh, you know circle all those through, and then uh, as you as you as you say, uh, uh, get the maximum uh, you know, or the minimum p value in that in that instance, and then and then see whether under permutation that you find the uh, distribution for that minimum p value and so on. Uh, at the same time, uh, some of those models uh, should probably be rejected just on the on the basis of the uh, so that that distribution uh, maybe 
uh, like uh, you know may, may, may not be like uh, may, I don't know what the, the effect of it would have, but uh, it is possible that we should uh, you know have something that says oh all right so that variable that certainly have some effect uh, we, it should be included in the model and uh, you know in that in that specific instance we, we know that we should include the uh, uh, the total brain volume and the, uh, and, and and that's uh, but 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 showing the vibration effect and, and and estimating the probability on that vibration effect I think it's a very interesting approach. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, yeah, yeah. It it would not tell specifically which variable should or should not be, but you can tell at the end you can say right. I looked into however many models I tried yeah. uh, with or without some procedure for variable selection, yeah. and you can give a p value that says yes, that's that's my correct p value yeah. after I have looked into all this. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't require independence between the models, so you can repeat variables, sure. right? Sure, it's and, a and permutation. All the yeah, yeah all, all the models are, uh, they have some degree of no independence, right? Yeah. So that would accommodate that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, we need to move on. Uh, and uh, is I think Nina, you are you are wrapping up uh, and, uh, and, and uh, First of all, we want to um, say thank you for attending today. Um, I have a link above here. You also have in an email that I sent to you a few minutes ago. If it's easier to just click on the link. We wanted to take some time now to get immediate feedback from you so that we can know how people moved along the continuum uh, of learning today and be frank and be brutal, please, in your feedback because you are our lab rats today, um, and we want to improve what we're doing here. We want to tailor it to different audiences with different knowledge bases, and so this information helps us. Um, so I'm just going to stay quiet for about five minutes while you all go into your email or bring the URL up, and uh, then we can touch base about that in a few minutes. Yeah, the bit the bit.ly URL, or it should be an email that says something like link, first word, link to HBM survey.
So, so far we have 13 responses, so we're getting close. Uh, in the interim, um, I wanted to say the gentleman that was speaking about his software, um, you know, I was interested, so I went to the nitric.org website and I Googled on nitric in our search palm, and I realized, wow, he's got the software there, he's got the link to his GitHub, he updated it in April, his name is Anderson Wilker or Walker or something like that, so I knew exactly what he was talking about. So that's my shameless plug for the Nitric website, which each of you all should have received a page on. We'll be in booth 10, uh, and we have lots of candy, and we get bored. So to the extent you can swing by and visit, uh, we have data to share um, and a lot of information to share, and would love your feedback on our redesign. Um, the same team that is behind Repronym is the same, most of the same team behind Nitric. Uh, so. There's a lot of connections between the two. So we'll just go ahead now, since we have already 15 responses and some folks have left. Um, and just for fun, we're just going to show the uh, slides, um, the questions side by side, your responses, so you can see the difference. Since I can't read over there, I'll just come over here. Um, so the one question we didn't ask before was whether you had problems downloading uh, the course materials before. That'll give us some information on how to make that easier in the future. Um, so if we could just scroll down on the next one to make it even. All right. So well, we did move some people along the continuum. Uh, on the first one. Um, I'm not a statistician, so we're just going to scroll through these quickly and you can visualize them and make your own uh, assumptions from this and, and critique the survey questions afterwards um, to see if they were biased or not. Um, but I do see that we did move people along the continuum for the motivations. Um, and we got some comments there. Let's go to fair data. And well, Again, improvements here, although I'm a little concerned because the one person that thought they were very familiar is not, but I don't know, you know, we've got different respondees on, on each of these, so we can't exactly compare it one to one. Um, we've taken a lot of notes about issues and questions that people brought up, um, and we'll be using those notes to improve things in the future. Also, all the presentations and additional information is on GitHub. Um, I'll be sending an email link out to everybody with the link to that GitHub. There's a question? Oh, yeah. Gee. OK. The new one is the one on the left. <laughs> I was going to say, that's really bad. We're swimming backwards. Um, <laughs> can you switch it? <laughs> it? It doesn't work with my brain if I don't see it that way. Better, 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 better. Okay, uh, number two. Let's. Good, 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 good. Um, <laughs> a lot less responses on this one. But I'm not too happy about this. Um, we'll have to read through all the comments. Let's keep going. This one looks a lot healthier. Let's keep going. I'm going to leave this to you to draw your own conclusions. <laughs> um, for those of you who haven't completed the survey, please make sure to do so because we had a lot, res lot more responses initially. Um, and then. Conclusion? This is the big one. 
Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Hopefully there's some of you that are just taking more time to complete the survey that'll skew it a little bit more to the right. All right. Um, does anyone have any additional questions that you want to ask before taking off today other than us providing you access to additional information like this on GitHub and the presentations? David, did you want to make any concluding comments or JB? I just hope it's going to be it's been useful and uh, and you had uh, some some kind of fun in, in some ways um, and um, and really we value your feedback if you think uh, uh, you 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 realize that there was there's so much that has been presented uh, there's a really a, a very large body of uh, knowledge that has been uh, presented so if even if you just grab uh, maybe uh, you know twenty percent or thirty percent of that I think it's it's already a good uh, a good step and. Uh, and even if you you just like uh, now have a very uh, a, a greater awareness of all the, the problems, the potential problems, and, and awareness of the tools that uh, you can uh, use for uh, mending those things, uh, those problems. I think that's uh, that's already uh, we'll be. Uh, I think we, we should be already happy with that uh, uh, that outcome. Uh, yeah, no, I think uh, and please uh, please uh, interact on GitHub on the. Course, so all the material is on GitHub, and you can raise issues and, uh, and, and say, hey, this is not very clear, or uh, what was the section on that problem, and, and so on. So we can, uh, uh, you know, we can uh, collaboratively uh, continue to develop those uh, those materials. Uh, and yeah, no, I think uh, to us it's been very very instructive. I, we, I don't think you are the only one who have learned things. <laughs> uh, we have learned a lot uh, as well. Uh, you know, we're different. We have different backgrounds and different. Uh, so. Uh, been, it's been really good, and uh, yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, as well, I think uh, it's uh, you know it's a question of whether th that kind of experiment uh, uh, is, uh, is something that we should pursue in the future in the, at this conference, uh, something which is going away from the traditional presentation to the actual hands-on is uh, much more challenging. It's, uh, it's much more difficult. But uh, the question, I think, uh, you know, you have to say tell us whether that's worthwhile uh, doing and, and pursuing. My only uh, echoing is that uh, hopefully if you found any of these tantalizing that you do need to know, know more, there is a you know, much more uh, information to be learned as we encourage you to uh, continue the education on this. And also just to remind one more time that this train the trainer type of uh, idea that you guys are encouraged to you know, finish those courses and then to help us you know, spread the news to others and do your own training. And again, we're all into helping you do that and there's uh, certificates and things like that that we can help work on. And again, we need to get you guys taught, and you guys need to teach the theory people, and we really want to encourage that. And so thank you for attending, and thank you for uh, keeping attentive to this topic as you go forward. Thank you all. Oh, remark. One last thing. I know people who are perhaps at different stages with getting things running, not running. If you have any questions, that GitHub repo that you saw, the OHVM training, there's an issue tracker there. Feel very free to submit issues over there and we'll help you out remotely or elsewhere to fix things up. Thank you again. Have a great conference and a good evening. And uh, yeah, hopefully see you next time. <laughs>